Call the Midwife, a true story of the East End in the 1950s, by Jennifer Worth. Read by Stephanie Cole. Why did I ever start this? I must have been mad. There were dozens of other things I could have been. Model, air hostess, a ship stewardess, all glamorous, highly paid jobs. Only an idiot would choose to be a nurse. And now, a midwife. 2.30 in the morning. I struggle half asleep into my uniform. Only three hours sleep after a 17-hour working day. Who would do such a job? It is bitterly cold and raining outside. Nonata's house itself is cold enough and the bicycle shed even colder. In the dark, through blind force of habit, I fit my delivery bag onto a bicycle and push it into the deserted street. Round the corner, Leyland Street, across the East India Dock Road and then onto the Isle of Dogs. The rain has woken me up and the steady pedalling calms my temper. Why did I go into nursing? My thoughts flit back five or six years. Certainly there had been no feeling of vocation, none of the burning desire to heal the sick that nurses are supposed to feel. What was it then? A broken heart, certainly. The need to get away, a challenge. The sexy uniform with the cuffs and ruffs, the pinched-in waists and pert little caps. <laughs> That's a laugh, I think, as I pedal through the rain in my navy gabardine, with the cap pulled well down over my head. Sexy indeed. Over the first swing bridge that closes off the dry docks. All day they teem with noise and life as the great vessels are loaded and unloaded. Thousands of men, dockers, stevedores, drivers, pilots, sailors, fitters, crane drivers, all toiling ceaselessly. Now the docks are silent. The only sound is the movement of water. The darkness is intense. Past the tenements where countless thousands sleep four or five to a bed in their little two-room flats. Two rooms for a family of twelve children. How do they manage it? I cycle on, intent on getting to my patient. A couple of policemen wave and call out their greetings. The human contact raises my spirits no end. Nurses and policemen always have a rapport, especially in the East End. It's interesting, I reflect, that they always go around in pairs for mutual protection. Yet we nurses and midwives are always alone, on foot or bicycle. We would never be touched. So deep is the respect, even reverence, of the roughest, toughest docker for the district midwives that we can go anywhere alone, day or night, without fear. The dark, unlit road lies before me. The road across the aisle is continuous, but narrow streets lead off it, crisscrossing each other, each containing thousands of terraced houses. The road has a romantic appeal, because the sound of the river is always present. Soon I turn off the West Ferry Road into the side streets. I can see my patient's house at once, the only house with a light on. It seems there is a deputation of women waiting inside to greet me. The patient's mother, her grandmothers, two or three aunts, sisters, best friends, a neighbour. Well, thank God Mrs Jenkins isn't here this time, I think. Lurking somewhere in the background of this powerful sisterhood is a solitary male, the origin of all the commotion. I always feel sorry for the men in this situation. They seem so marginalised. The noise and the chatter of the women engulfs me like a blanket. Hello, lovey, how's yourself? You got here nice and quick, then? Let's have your coat and your hat. Nasty night. Come on in and get warm, then. How about a nice cup of tea? That'll warm the cockles, eh, lovey? She's upstairs where you left her. Pain's about every five minutes. She's been asleep since you left just afore midnight. Then she woke up about two-ish. Pain's getting worse and faster, so we reckons as how we ought to call the midwife, eh, Mum? Mum agrees and bustles forth authoritatively. We got the water hot and a load of nice clean towels and got the fire going so it's all nice and warm for the new baby. I have never been able to talk much and in this situation I don't need to. I give them my coat and hat but decline their tea as experience has taught me that in general poplar tea is revolting. Strong enough to creosote a fence, stewed for hours and laced with sticky, sweet, condensed milk. 
I am glad that I shaved Muriel earlier in the day when the light was good enough to do it without risk of cutting her. I also gave the required enema. It's a job I hate, so thankfully it is over. Besides which, who would want to give a two-pint soap and water enema, especially if there was no lavatory in the house, with all the resultant mess and smell at 2.30 in the morning? I go upstairs to Muriel, a buxom girl of twenty-five, who is having her fourth baby. The gaslight sheds a soft, warm glow over the room. The fire blazes fiercely, and the heat is almost suffocating. A quick glance tells me that Muriel is nearing the second stage of labour, the sweating, the slight panting, the curious interned look that a woman has at this time as she concentrates every ounce of her mental and physical strength on her body and on the miracle she is about to bring forth. She doesn't say anything, just squeezes my hand and gives a preoccupied smile. I left her three hours earlier in the first stage of labour. She had been niggling in false labour all day and was very tired, so I gave chloral hydrate at about 10 p.m., in the hope that she would sleep all night and wake in the morning refreshed. It hasn't worked. Does labour ever go the way you want it to? I have to be sure how far on she is, so prepare to do a vaginal examination. As I scrub up, another pain comes on. You can see it building in strength until it seems her poor body will break. It has been estimated that at the height of labour, each uterine contraction exerts the same pressure as the closing of the doors of an underground tube train. I can well believe it as I watch Muriel's labour. Her mother and sister are sitting with her, she clings to them in speechless, gasping agony, then sinks back, exhausted, to gather her strength for the next contraction. I put on my gloves and lubricate my hand. I ask Muriel to draw her knees up as I wanted to examine her. She knows exactly what I'm going to do and why. I put a sterile sheet under her buttocks and slip two fingers into her vagina. The head, well down, anterior presentation... Only a thin rim of cervix remaining, but water's apparently not yet broken. I listen to the fetal heart, a steady one-thirty. Good. That is all I need to know. I tell her everything is normal and that she hasn't far to go now. Then another pain starts, and all words and actions have to be suspended in the enormous intensity of labour. My tray has to be set out. The chest of drawers has been cleared to provide a working surface. I lay out my scissors, cord clamps, cord tape, fetal stethoscope, kidney dishes, gauze and cotton swabs, artery forceps. Not a great deal is necessary. In any case, it has to be easily portable, both on a bicycle and up and down the miles of tenement stairs and balconies. The bed has been prepared. We supplied a maternity pack, which was collected by the husband a week or two before delivery, it contains maternity pads, large absorbent sheets which are disposable, and non-absorbent brown paper that looks absurdly old-fashioned, but it is entirely effective. It covers the bed, all the absorbent pads and sheets can be laid on it, and after delivery everything can be bundled up into it and burned. The cot is ready. A good-sized washing bowl is available, and gallons of hot water are being boiled downstairs. There is no running hot water in the house, and I wonder how they used to manage when there was no water at all. But I hadn't time to sit and reflect. Often in a labour you can wait all night, but this one will not go that way. The increasing power and frequency of the pains, coupled with the fact that it is a fourth baby, indicate the second stage is not far away. The pains are coming every three minutes now. How much more can she bear? How much can any woman bear? Suddenly the sack bursts and water floods the bed. I like to see it that way. I get a bit apprehensive if the waters break early. After the contraction, the mother and I change the soaking sheets. Muriel can't get up at this stage, so we have to roll her. With the next contraction, I see the head. Intense concentration is now necessary. With animal instinct, she begins pushing. If all is well, a multigravider can often push the head out in seconds, but you don't want it that way. Every good midwife tries to ensure a slow, steady delivery of the head. I want you on your left side, Muriel, after this contraction. Try not to push now while you're on your back. That's it. Turn over, dear, and face the wall. Draw your right leg up towards your chin. 
Breathe deeply. Just concentrate on breathing deeply. Your sister will help you. I lean over the low, sagging bed. All beds seem to sag in the middle in these parts. Sometimes I've had to deliver a baby on my knees. Another contraction is coming. Breathe deeply. Push a little, not too hard. The contraction passes, and I listen to the fetal heart again. One forty this time. Still quite normal, but the raised heartbeat shows how much a baby goes through in the ordeal of being born. Another contraction. Push just a little, Muriel, not too hard. You'll soon have your baby born. She is beside herself with pain, but a sort of frantic elation comes over a woman during the last few moments of labour, and the pain doesn't seem to matter. Another contraction. The head is coming fast, too fast. Don't push, Muriel. Just pant, in, out, quickly. Keep panting like that. I'm holding the head back to prevent it bursting out and splitting the perineum. It is very important to ease the head out between contractions, and as I hold the head back, I realise I am sweating from the effort required, the concentration, the heat and intensity of the moment. The contraction passes, and I relax a little, listening to the fetal heart again, still normal. Delivery is imminent. I place the heel of my right hand behind the dilated anus, and push forward firmly and steadily until the crown is clear of the vulva. With the next contraction, Muriel, the head will be born. Now, I don't want you to push at all. Just let the muscles of your stomach do the job. All you have to do is try to relax and just pant like mad. I steel myself for the next contraction, which comes with surprising speed. Muriel is panting continuously. I ease the perineum around the emerging crown, and the head is born. We all breathe a sigh of relief. Muriel is weak with the effort. Well done, Muriel. You are doing wonderfully. It won't be long now. The next pain, and we will know if it's a boy or a girl. The baby's face is blue and puckered, covered in mucus and blood. I check the heartbeat. Still normal. I observe the restitution of the head through one-eighth of a circle. The presenting shoulder can now be delivered from under the pubic arch. Another contraction. This is it, Muriel. You can push now. Hard! I ease the presenting shoulder out with a forward and upward sweep. The other shoulder and arm follow, and the baby's whole body slides out effortlessly. It's another little boy, cried the mother. Thanks be to God. Is he healthy, nurse? Muriel was in tears of joy. Oh, bless him. Here, let me have a look. Oh, he's lovely. I am almost as overwhelmed as Muriel. The relief of a safe delivery is so powerful. I clamp the baby's cord in two places and cut between. I hold him by the ankles upside down to ensure no mucus is inhaled. He breathes. The baby is now a separate being. I wrap him in the towels given to me and hand him to Muriel, who cradles him, coos over him, kisses him, calls him beautiful, lovely, an angel. Quite honestly, a baby covered in blood, still slightly blue, eyes screwed up in the first few minutes after birth, is not an object of beauty, but the mother never sees him that way. To her, he is all perfection. My job is not done, however. The placenta must be delivered, and it must be delivered whole, with no pieces torn off and left behind in the uterus. If there are, the woman will be in serious trouble. Infection, ongoing bleeding, perhaps even a massive hemorrhage, which can be fatal. It is perhaps the trickiest part of any delivery, to get the placenta out whole and intact. The uterine muscles, having succeeded in the massive task of delivering the baby, often seem to want to take a holiday. Frequently, there are no further contractions for ten to fifteen minutes. This is nice for the mother, who only wants to lie back and cuddle her baby, but it can be an anxious time for the midwife. When contractions do start, they are frequently very weak. Successful delivery of the placenta is usually a question of careful timing, judgment, and most of all, experience. They say it takes seven years of practice to make a good midwife. I was only in my first year.
alone, in the middle of the night, with this trusting woman and her family, and no telephone in the house. Please, God, don't let me make a mistake, I prayed. After clearing the worst of the mess from the bed, I lay Muriel on her back, on warm, dry maternity pads, and cover her with a blanket. Her pulse and blood pressure are normal, and the baby lies quietly in her arms. All I have to do is wait. I sit on a chair beside the bed with my hand on the fundus in order to feel and assess. Sometimes the third stage can take twenty to thirty minutes. I muse over the importance of patience and the possible disasters that can occur from a desire to hasten things. The fundus feels soft and broad, so the placenta is obviously still attached in the upper uterine segment. There are no contractions for a full ten minutes. The cord protrudes from the vagina, and it is my practice to clamp it just below the vulva so I can see when the cord lengthens a sign of the placenta separating and descending into the lower uterine segment. But nothing is happening. It goes through my mind that reports you hear of taxi drivers or bus conductors safely delivering a baby never mention this. Any bus driver can deliver a baby in an emergency, but who would have the faintest idea of how to manage the third stage? I imagine that most uninformed people would want to pull the cord, thinking this would help expel the placenta, but it can lead to sheer disaster. Muriel is cooing and kissing her baby while her mother tidies up. The fire crackles. I sit, quietly waiting, pondering. Why aren't midwives the heroines of society that they should be? Why do they have such a low profile? They ought to be lauded to the skies by everyone. But they are not. The responsibility they carry is immeasurable. Their skill and knowledge are matchless. Yet they are completely taken for granted and usually overlooked. All medical students in the 1950s were trained by midwives. They had classroom lectures from an obstetrician, certainly, but without clinical practice lectures are meaningless. So in all teaching hospitals, medical students were attached to a teacher midwife and would go out with her in the district to learn the skill of practical midwifery. All GPs had been trained by a midwife, but these facts seem to be barely known. The fundus tightens and rises a little in the abdomen as a contraction grips the muscles. Perhaps this is it, I think. But no, it doesn't feel right. Too soft after the contraction. Another wait. I reflect upon the incredible advance in midwifery practice over the century, the struggle that dedicated women have had to obtain a proper training and to train others. There has been recognized training for less than fifty years. In the nineteenth century, no poor woman could afford to pay the fee required by a doctor for the delivery of her baby, so she was forced to rely on the services of a self-taught midwife or handywoman, Nursing and midwifery were not considered a respectable occupation for any educated woman, so the illiterate filled the gap. The caricature figures of Sari Gamp and Betsy Prigg, ignorant, filthy, gin-swilling women created by Charles Dickens, may seem hilarious, but would not have been funny if you had to place your life in their hands. In the mid-nineteenth century, maternal mortality amongst the poorest classes stood at around thirty-five to forty percent, and infant mortality was around sixty percent. Florence Nightingale changed nursing forever, but she was not alone, and many groups of far-sighted and dedicated women devoted their lives to raising the standards of nursing. It was in the struggle to provide legislation for the proper training of midwives that they encountered the fiercest opposition. From about 1870, the battle raged. They were called an absurdity, time wasters, a curiosity, and an objectionable body of busybodies. They were accused of everything from perversion to greed for unlimited financial gain. For thirty years the battle continued, but in 1902 the first Midwives Act was passed and the Royal College of Midwives was born. Another contraction coming. The fundus rises under my hand and remains hard. At the same time, the forceps I had clamped to the cord move. I test them. Yes, another four to six inches of cord comes out easily. The placenta has separated. I ask Muriel to hand the baby to her mother. She knows what I'm going to do. 
I massage the fundus in my hand until it is hard and round and mobile. Then I grasp it firmly and push downwards and backwards into the pelvis. As I push, the placenta appears at the vulva and I lift it out with my other hand. The membranes slide out, followed by a gush of fresh blood and some clotted blood. I feel weak with relief. It is accomplished. I put the kidney dish on the dresser to await my inspection and sit beside Muriel for a further ten minutes massaging the fundus to ensure that it remains hard and round, which will expel residual blood clots. In later years, oxytocics would be routinely given after the birth of the baby, causing immediate and vigorous uterine contraction, so the placenta is expelled within three to five minutes of the baby's birth. Medical science marches on, but in the 1950s we had no such aids to delivery. All that remains is to clean up. While Mrs. Hawking is washing and changing her daughter, I examine the placenta. It seems complete and the membranes intact. Then I examine the baby, who appears healthy and normal. I bathe and dress him and reflect upon Muriel's joy and happiness, her relaxed, easy countenance. She looks tired, but no sign of stress or strain. There never is. There must be an inbuilt system of total forgetfulness in a woman, some chemical or hormone that immediately enters the memory part of the brain after delivery, so there is absolutely no recall of the agony that has gone before. If this were not so, no woman would ever have a second baby. When everything is shipshape, the proud father is permitted to enter. These days, most fathers are with their wives throughout labour and attend the birth, but this is a recent fashion. Throughout history, as far as I know, it was unheard of. Certainly in the 1950s, everyone would have been profoundly shocked at such an idea. Childbirth was considered to be a woman's business. Even the presence of doctors, all men until the late 19th century, was resisted, and it was not until obstetrics became recognised as a medical science that men attended childbirth. Jim is a little man, probably less than thirty, but he looks nearer forty. He sidles into the room looking sheepish and confused. Probably my presence makes him tongue-tied, but I doubt if he has ever had a great command of the English language. He mutters, All right, Ingo, and gives Muriel a peck on the cheek. He looks even tinier beside his buxom wife, who could give him a good five stone in weight. Her flushed, pink, newly washed skin makes him look even more grey, pinched and dried out. All the result of a sixty-hour working week in the docks, I think to myself. Then he looks at the baby, hums a bit. He is obviously thinking deeply about a suitable epithet, clears his throat and says, Go, he ain't half a bit of all right then. And then he leaves. I regret that I have not been able to get to know the men of the East End, but it is quite impossible. I belong to the women's world, to the taboo subject of childbirth. The men are polite and respectful to us midwives, but completely withdrawn from any familiarity, let alone friendship. There is a total divide between what is called men's work and women's work. So, like Jane Austen, who in all her writing never recorded a conversation between two men alone, because as a woman she could not know what exclusively male conversation would be like, I cannot record much about the men of Poplar beyond superficial observation. It has been a long day and night, but a profound sense of fulfilment and satisfaction lighten my step and lift my heart. Muriel and Baby are both asleep as I creep out of the room. The good people downstairs offer me more tea, which again I decline as gracefully as I can, saying that breakfast will be waiting for me at Nonata's house. I give instructions to call us, if there seems to be any cause for worry, but say that I will be back again around lunchtime and again in the evening. I entered the house in the rain and the dark. There had been a fever of excitement and anticipation, and the anxiety of a woman in labour, on the brink of bringing forth new life. I leave a calm, sleeping household with the new soul in their midst and step out into morning sunlight. I cycled through the dark, deserted streets, past the locked gates, the silent docks. 
Now I cycle through bright early morning, the sun just rising over the river, the gates opening, men streaming through the streets, calling to each other, engines beginning to sound, the cranes to move, lorries turning in through the huge gates, the sounds of a ship as it moved. A dockyard is not a glamorous place, but to a young girl with only three hours sleep on twenty-four hours of work, after the quiet thrill of a safe delivery of a healthy baby, it is intoxicating. I don't even feel tired. The swing bridge is open now, which means that the road is closed. A great, ocean-going cargo boat is slowly and majestically entering the waters, her bows and funnels within inches of the houses on either side. I wait, dreamily watching the pilots and navigators guide her to her berth. I would love to know how they do it. Their skill is immense, taking years to learn, and is passed on from father to son or uncle to nephew, so they say. They are the princes of the Docklands, and the casual labourers treat them with the deepest respect. It takes about fifteen minutes for a boat to go through the bridge. Time to think. Strange how my life has developed. From a childhood disrupted by the war, a passionate love affair when I was only sixteen, and the knowledge three years later that I had to get away. So, for purely pragmatic reasons, my choice was nursing. Do I regret it? A sharp, piercing sound wakes me from my reverie, and the swing bridge begins to close. The road is open again, and the traffic begins to move. I cycle close to the curb, lorries around me. A huge man with muscles like steel pulls off his cap and shouts, Morning, Nos! I shout back, Morning, lovely day! And cycle on, exulting in my youth, the morning air, the heady excitement of the docks, but above all, in the matchless sensation of having delivered a beautiful baby to a joyful mother. Why did I ever start? Do I regret it? Never, never, never. I wouldn't swap my job for anything on earth. Had anyone told me, two years earlier, that I would be going to a convent for midwifery training, I would have run a mile. I was not that sort of girl. Convents were for Holy Marys, dreary and plain, not for me. I had thought that Nonata's house was a small, privately run hospital, of which there were many hundreds in the country at that time. I arrived on a damp October evening, having known only the West End of London. The bus from Aldgate brought me to a very different London, with narrow, unlit streets, bomb sites and dirty grey buildings. With difficulty I found Leyland Street and looked for the hospital. It was not there. Perhaps I had the wrong address. I stopped to pass by and inquired for the midwives of St. Raymond Nonatus. The lady put down her string bag and beamed at me cordially, the missing front teeth adding to the geniality of her features. Her metal hair curlers gleamed in the darkness. She took a cigarette from her mouth and said something that sounded like, You're washing an Arton's arse, eh, dearie? I stared at her. I had not mentioned washing anything, particularly anyone's arse. No, I want the midwives of St. Raymond Nonatus. Yeah, like what I says, ducky. The Nonartans, over there, dearie. That's their arse. She patted my arm reassuringly, pointed to a building, stuck the cigarette back in her mouth, and toddled off, her bedroom slippers flapping on the pavement. At this point in my narrative, it would be expedient to refer the bewildered reader to the difficulties of the Cockney dialect. Pure Cockney is, or was, incomprehensible to an outsider, but the ear grows accustomed until it all becomes perfectly obvious. As I write about the Docklands people, I can hear their voices. But I digress. I looked at the building dubiously. I saw dirty red brick Victorian arches and turrets, iron railings, no lights, all next to a bomb site. What on earth have I come to, I thought. That's no hospital. I pulled the bell handle, and a deep clanging came from within. A few moments later the door was opened by a nun. She was tall and thin and very, very old. She looked at me steadily for at least a minute without speaking, then leaned forward and took my hand. 
She looked all around her, drew me into the hallway, and whispered conspiratorially, The poles are diverging, my dear. Astonishment robbed me of speech, but she continued with near breathless excitement. Yes, and Mars and Venus are in alignment. You know what that means, of course. I shook my head. Oh, my dear, the static forces, the convergence of the fluid with the solid, the descent of the hexagon as it passes through the ether. This is a unique time to be alive. So exciting, the little angels clap their wings. She laughed, clapped her bony hands, and did a little skip. But come in, come in, my dear. You must have some tea and some cake. The cake is very good. Do you like cake? I nodded. So do I. We shall have some together, my dear, and you must give me your opinion on the theory that the depths in space are forever being pulled by the process of gravitation into heavenly bodies. She turned and walked swiftly down a stone passage, her white veil floating behind her. I must surely have come to the wrong address. But she seemed to expect me to be right behind her, and talked all the while, asking questions to which she clearly did not expect an answer. She entered a very large Victorian-looking kitchen, with a stone floor, stone sink, wooden draining boards, tables and cupboards. The room contained an old-fashioned gas stove with wooden plate racks above it, a large Ascot water heater over the sink, and lead pipes attached to the walls. A large coke burner stood in one corner, the flue running up to the ceiling. Now for the cake, said my companion. Mrs. B made it this morning. I saw her with my own eyes. Where have they put it? You had better look around, dear. Entering the wrong house is one thing, but poking around in someone else's kitchen is quite another. I spoke for the first time. Is this Nonata's house? The old lady raised her hands in a theatrical gesture, and in clear, ringing tones cried out, Not born, yet born in death, born to greatness, born to lead and inspire. She raised her eyes to the ceiling and lowered her voice to a thrilling whisper. Born to be sanctified. Was she mad? I had yet to learn that St. Raymond Nonatus is the patron saint of midwives, obstetricians, pregnant women, childbirth, and newborn babies. He was delivered by Caesarean section, Nonatus is the Latin for not born, in Catalonia, Spain, in 1204. His mother, not surprisingly, died at his birth. He became a priest and died in 1240. I stared at her in dumb stupefaction, then repeated the question, Yes, but is this Nonata's house? Oh, my dear, I knew the moment I saw you that you would understand. The cloud rests unbroken, youth is freely given, the chimes sing of sad indigo's deep vermilion. Let us make what sense of it we can. Put the kettle on, dear, don't just stand there. So I filled the kettle, and the pipes all around the kitchen rattled and shook with a most alarming noise. The old lady poked around, opening cupboards and tins, chatting all the while about cosmic rays and confluent ethers. Suddenly she gave a cry of delight. The cake! The cake! I knew I would find it! She turned to me and whispered, with a naughty gleam in her eye, they think they can hide things from Sister Monica Joan, but they are not smart enough, my dear. Plodding or swift, laughter or despair, none can hide, all will be revealed. Get two plates and a knife, and don't hang around. Where's the tea? We sat down at the huge wooden table. I poured the tea, and Sister Monica Joan cut two large slices of cake. She ate with murmurs of ecstatic delight, and winked at me as she gobbled. The cake was excellent, and a fellowship of conspiracy was entered into as we agreed that another slice would be in order. They will never know, my dear. They will think that Fred has had it. She looked out of the window. There is a light in the sky. Do you think it is a planet exploding or an alien landing? I thought it was an aeroplane, but I opted for the exploding planet. 
then said, How about some more tea? Just what I was about to suggest. And what about another slice of cake? They won't be back before seven, you know. She chatted on. I could not make head nor tail of what she was on about, but she was enchanting. The more I looked at her, the more I could see fragile beauty in her high cheekbones, her bright eyes, her wrinkled pale ivory skin, and the perfect balance of her head on her long, slender neck. The constant movement of her expressive hands, with their long fingers like a ballet of ten dancers, was hypnotic. I felt myself falling under a spell. We finished the cake with no trouble at all, having agreed that an empty tin would be less conspicuous than a small wedge of cake left on a plate. She winked mischievously and chuckled. That tiresome Sister Evangelina will be the first to notice. You should see her, my dear, when she gets cross. Oh, the hideous baggage! Her red face gets even redder, and her nose drips. Yes, it actually drips. She tossed her head haughtily. But what can it signify for me? The mystery of the evidence of consciousness is a house in a given time, a function and an event combined, and few are the elite, indeed, who can welcome such a realization. But hush, what is that? Make haste. She leapt up, scattering cake crumbs all over the table, the floor and herself, grabbed the tin and hurried to the larder. Then she sat down again assuming an exaggerated expression of innocence. Footsteps were heard on the stone floor of the hallway and female voices. Three nuns entered the kitchen, talking about enemas, constipation and varicose veins. I concluded that I must, against all expectations, be in the right place. One of them stopped and addressed me. You must be Nurse Lee. We were expecting you. Welcome to Nonata's house. I am Sister Julienne, the sister in charge. Have you eaten? The face and the voice were so open and honest and the question so artless that I felt the cake sitting heavily in my stomach. I managed to murmur, Yes, thank you, and surreptitiously brushed a crumb off my skirt. Well, you will excuse us if we have a meal. We usually prepare our own supper because we all come in at different times. The sisters were bustling about, fetching things from the larder to the kitchen table. A cry came from behind the door, and a red-faced nun emerged, carrying the cake tin. It's gone. The tin's empty. Where is Mrs. B's cake? She made it only this morning. This must be Sister Evangelina. Her face was getting redder as she glared around. No one spoke. Sister Monica Jones sat aloof beyond all reproach, her eyes closed. The cake was doing something nasty to my intestines, and I knew the enormity of my crime could not be concealed. My voice was husky as I whispered, I had a little. The red face and heavy figure advanced towards Sister Monica Joan. And she's had the rest of it. Look at her. Covered in cake crumbs. Oh, the greedy thing. She can't keep her hands off anything. That cake was for all of us. You, you... Sister Evangelina was shaking with rage as she towered over Sister Monica Joan, who remained immobile, her eyes closed, as though she had not heard a word. She looked fragile and aristocratic. I could not bear it and found my voice. No, you've got it wrong. Sister Monica Joan had a slice... And I had the rest. The three nuns stared at me in astonishment. I felt myself blush. Had I been a dog caught stealing the Sunday roast, I would have crept under the table with my tail between my legs. I could only mutter, I'm sorry. I was hungry. I won't do it again. Sister Evangelina snorted and banged the tin on the table. Sister Monica Joan, whose eyes were still closed, Head turned away, moved for the first time. She took a handkerchief from her pocket and handed it to Sister Evangelina, holding it by a corner with thumb and forefinger, the other fingers arched fastidiously. Perhaps it is time for a little mopping up, dear, she said sweetly. Rage boiled even more fiercely. 
The redness of Sister Evangelina's features turned to purple and moisture gathered round her nostrils. No, thank you, dear. I have one of my own, she spat through clenched teeth. Sister Monica Joan gave an affected little jump, brushed her face elegantly with a handkerchief, and murmured as though to herself, Methinks tis raining. I cannot abide the rain. I will retire. Pray excuse me, sisters. We will meet at Compline. She smiled graciously at the three sisters, then gave me the biggest, naughtiest wink I had ever seen in my life. Haughtily, she sailed out of the kitchen. I felt myself squirm with embarrassment. I just wanted to sink through the floor. Sister Julienne told me to take my case to the top floor, where I would find a room with my name on the door. I had expected a heavy silence and three pairs of eyes following me as I left the kitchen, but Sister Julienne started talking about an old lady she had just visited, whose cat appeared to be stuck up the chimney. They all laughed, and to my intense relief, the atmosphere lightened at once. In the hallway, I seriously wondered whether or not to cut and run. I could have just picked up my case and vanished into the darkness. It was tempting. In fact, I might have done so had the front door not opened and two laughing young girls appeared. Their faces were pink and freshened by the night air, their hair untidy from the wind. Rain glistened on their long gabardine raincoats. They were about my age and looked happy and full of life. Hello, said a deep, slow voice. You must be Jenny Lee. How nice. You'll like it here. There are not too many of us. I'm Cynthia and this is Trixie. But Trixie had already disappeared towards the kitchen with the words, I'm famished. See you later. Cynthia's voice was astonishing, soft, low, and slightly husky. She also spoke extremely slowly and with just a touch of laughter in her tone. In another type of girl, it would have been the cultivated, sexy voice of Allure. I'd met plenty of that type in four years of nursing, but Cynthia was not one of their number. Her voice was completely natural, and she could speak no other way. My discomfort and uncertainty left me, and we grinned at each other, friends already. I decided... I would stay. Later that evening, I was called to Sister Julienne's office. I went filled with dread, expecting a severe dressing down about the cake. Having endured four years of tyranny from hospital nursing hierarchies, I expected the worst. Sister Julienne was small and plump. She must have worked about fifteen or sixteen hours that day, but she looked as fresh as a daisy. Her radiant smile reassured me and dispelled my fears. Her first words were, we will say nothing more about the cake. I gave a great sigh of relief, and Sister Julienne burst out laughing. Strange things happen to us all in the company of Sister Monica Joan, but I assure you no one will mention it again, not even Sister Evangelina. She said the last words with special emphasis, and I found myself laughing also. I was completely won over, and glad I had not been so rash as to run away. Her next words were unexpected. What is your religion, nurse? Well, um, none. Uh, well, that is, Methodist, I think. The question seemed astonishing, irrelevant, even slightly silly. To ask about my education, my training and experience in nursing would have been anticipated and acceptable. But religion? What had religion to do with anything? She looked very grave and said gently, Jesus Christ is our strength and guidance here. Perhaps you will join us sometimes at church on a Sunday? Sister then went on to explain the training I would receive and the routine of Nonata's house. I would be under the supervision of a trained midwife for all visits for about three weeks and then go out alone for ante- and postnatal work. All deliveries would be supervised by another midwife. Classroom lectures were held once a week in the evening after work. All study would be done in our spare time. She sat quietly explaining other details, but I was wondering about her and why I felt so comfortable and happy in her company. A bell rang. She smiled. It is time for Compline. I must go. We will meet in the morning. I hope you have a restful night. The impact Sister Julienne made upon me, and I discovered most people, was out of all proportion to her words or her appearance. 
She was not imposing or commanding nor arresting in any way. She was not even particularly clever. But something radiated from her, and ponder as I might, I could not understand it. It did not occur to me at the time that her radiance had a spiritual dimension, owing nothing to the values of the temporal world. It was 6 a.m. when I arrived back at Nonata's house after Muriel's delivery, and I was ravenous. A night's work and an eight-mile cycle ride can sharpen a young appetite like nothing else. The house was quiet when I entered. The nuns were in chapel and the lay staff not yet up. I was tired, but I knew that I had to clean my delivery bag, sterilize my instruments, complete my notes, and leave them on the office desk before I could eat. Breakfast was laid out in the dining room, and I would take mine first, then go to bed for a few hours. I raided the larder. A pot of tea, boiled eggs, toast, homemade gooseberry jam, cornflakes, homemade yoghurt and scones. Heaven! The delicious cakes and biscuits and crunchy bread were made either by the nuns or by the many local women who came in to work at Nonata's house. Any staff who missed a meal through being called out had free run of the larder. I was deeply grateful for this liberality, which was so unlike hospitals, where you had to plead for food if you had missed a meal for any reason. I left a note asking to be called at about 11.30 a.m. and persuaded my tired legs to carry me up to my bedroom. I slept like a baby, and when someone roused me with a cup of tea, I couldn't remember where I was. The tea reminded me. Only the kind sisters would send tea up to a nurse who had been working all night. In hospital, it would be a bang on the door, and that would be that. Nonata's house was situated in the heart of the London Docklands. The practice covered Stepney, Limehouse, Millwall, the Isle of Dogs, Cubitt Town, Poplar, Bow, Mile End and Whitechapel. The area was densely populated, and most families had lived there for generations, often not moving more than a street or two from their birthplace. Family life was lived at close quarters with children brought up by a widely extended family of aunts, grandparents, cousins and older siblings. And children were everywhere, with the streets their playgrounds. In the 1950s there were no cars in the back streets because no one had a car, so it was perfectly safe to play there. Most houses had a wireless, but I did not see a single TV set during my time in the East End. The pubs, the men's clubs, dances, cinemas, the music halls and dog racing were the main forms of relaxation. For the young people, the church was often the centre of social life, and every church had a series of youth clubs and activities going on every night of the week. All Saints Church in the East India Dock Road, a huge Victorian church, had many hundreds of youngsters in its youth club, run by the rector, and no less than seven energetic young curates. They needed all their youth and energy to cope night after night with activities for five or six hundred young people. I had only three calls before lunch, one to Muriel and two patients in the tenements I would pass on the way. Four hours of sleep had refreshed me completely, and I cycled off in high spirits in the sunshine. The tenements were always grim-looking, whatever the weather. They were constructed as a four-sided building with all the flats facing inwards. The buildings were six stories high, and sunlight seldom reached the inner courtyard, which was the social centre for the tenement dwellers. The courtyard contained all the washing lines, and as there were literally hundreds of flats in each block, they were never without loads of washing flapping in the wind. The dustbins were also in the courtyard. In the 1950s, there was a lavatory and running cold water in each flat. Before the introduction of these facilities, the lavatories and water were in the courtyard, and everyone had to go down to use them. I threaded my way through the washing and reached the stairway that I wanted. All the stairways were external, made of stone, and led up to an inward-facing balcony going all round the building. Each flat led off this balcony. Whereas the inner courtyard was the centre of social life, the balconies, teeming with life and gossip, were for the tenement women, equivalent to the streets of the terraced house dwellers. The outside world held little interest for the East Enders, and so other people's business was the primary topic of conversation. For most, it was the only interest, amusement or diversion. 
it is not surprising that savage fighting frequently broke out in the tenements. The tenements looked unusually cheerful in the noonday sun when I arrived that day. I picked my way through the litter and dustbins and washing in the courtyard. Small children crowded around. The midwife's delivery bag was an object of intense interest. They thought we carried the baby in it. I found my entry and climbed the five stories to the flat I wanted. All the flats were more or less the same, two or three rooms leading off each other. A stone sink in one corner of the main room, a gas stove and a cupboard constituting the kitchen. The lavatories, when they were introduced, had to be near the water supply, so they were situated in a corner near the sink. The installation of lavatories in each flat had been a great leap forward in public hygiene because it improved the conditions in the courtyard. It also avoided the necessity of chamber pots, which had to be emptied daily, the women carrying them downstairs to the emptying troughs. The ordure in the courtyards used to be disgusting, I was told. The tenements of London's East End were built around the 1850s, mainly to house the dock workers and their families. In their day, they were probably considered to be quite sufficient. They were certainly an improvement on the mud-floor hovels they replaced. The tenements were brick-built with a slate roof. Rain did not penetrate, and they were dry inside. I have no doubt that a hundred and fifty years ago they were even considered to be luxurious. A family of ten to twelve people in two or three rooms would not have been judged as overcrowding. After all, the vast majority of mankind has lived in such conditions throughout history. But times change, and by the 1950s the tenements were considered to be slum areas. The rents were a lot cheaper than the terraced houses, and consequently only the poorest families, those least able to cope, entered the tenements. Social law seems to suggest that the poorest families are often the ones that produce the greatest number of children, and the tenements were always teeming with them. Infectious diseases ran through the buildings like wildfire. So did the pests. Fleas, body lice, ticks, scabies, crabs, mice, rats and cockroaches. Life has changed irrevocably in the last fifty years. My memories of Docklands bear no resemblance to what is known today. Family and social life have broken down, and three things occurring together within a decade ended centuries of tradition. The closure of the docks, slum clearance, and the pill. The closure of the docks occurred over about fifteen years, but by 1980 the merchant ships came and went no more. Therefore the men were no longer needed. This was the end of the Docklands as I knew them. Slum clearance started in the late 1950s while I was still working in the area. No doubt the houses were grotty, but they were people's homes and much loved. I remember many, many people, old and young, men and women, holding a piece of paper from the council, informing them that their houses or flats were to be demolished and they were to be rehoused. Most were sobbing. They knew no other world, and a move of four miles seemed like going to the ends of the earth. The moves shattered the extended family, and children suffered as a result. The transition also literally killed many old people who could not adapt. What is the point of a spanking new flat with central heating and a bathroom if you never see your grandchildren, have no one to talk to? and your local, which sold the best beer in London, is now four miles away. The tenements, deemed unfit for human habitation and evacuated in the 1960s, stood empty for over a decade. They were finally demolished in 1982. The pill was introduced in the early 1960s, and modern woman was born. Women were no longer going to be tied to the cycle of endless babies. They were going to be themselves. With the pill came what we now call the sexual revolution. Women could, for the first time in history, be like men and enjoy sex for its own sake. In the late 1950s, we had 80 to 100 deliveries a month on our books. In 1963, the number had dropped to four or five a month. Now that is some social change. Edith was small and stringy and as tough as old boots. She looked a good deal older than forty. She had brought up six children. During the war they had been bombed out of a terraced house, but the family had survived. 
The children were then evacuated. Her husband was a dock labourer, and she was a munitions worker, and after the bombing they moved into the tenements which were cheaper to rent. They lived there throughout the Blitz, and miraculously the tenements, which were the most densely populated dwellings, were not hit. Edith did not see her children for five years, but they were reunited in 1945, and the family continued to live in the tenements. How anyone could manage in two rooms with six growing children was beyond my understanding, but they did, and thought nothing of it. She was furious to fall pregnant again, but like most women who have a baby late in life, she was besotted when he arrived, and cooed over him all the time. The flat was hung with nappies, and a pram further reduced the living space. Edith was up and doing. It was her tenth day after delivery. We kept mothers in bed for a long time after delivery in those days, ten to fourteen days, known as the lying-in period. Medically speaking, this was not good practice, as it is far better for a woman to get moving as soon as possible, thus reducing the risk of complications, such as thrombosis. But this was not known back then, and it had been traditional to keep women in bed after a birth. The great advantage was that it gave the woman a proper and well-earned rest. Other people had to do all the household chores, and for a brief period she could lead a life of idleness. She needed to gather her strength, because once she was on her feet again, everything would devolve to her. When you consider the physical effort required to carry all the shopping up those stairs, coal and wood in the winter, paraffin for stoves, or rubbish carried down to the dustbins in the courtyard, if you consider the fact that to take the baby out, the pram had to be bumped down the stairs, seventy steps if they lived at the top, one step at a time, then bumped up again to get home, often loaded with groceries, as well as the baby, you might begin to understand how tough these women had to be. Edith was in a grubby dressing gown and hair curlers, feeding her baby and smoking, with the radio blaring out pop music. She looked perfectly happy. In fact, she looked better than she had a couple of months earlier. The rest had done her good. Hello, lovey. Come on in. How about a nice cup of tea? I explained that I had other calls to make and declined the tea. The baby was sucking voraciously, but it struck me that Edith's thin little breasts probably did not contain much milk. However, it was far better than formula milk, so I said nothing. If the baby fails to gain weight, we can talk about it then, I thought. It was our practice to visit each day postnatally for a minimum of fourteen days, so we saw a lot of each patient. It became the fashion about that time to put babies onto formula milk, and to suggest to the mother that this would be best for the baby. The midwives of St. Raymond Nonatus did not go down this path, however, and all our patients were advised and helped to breastfeed for as long as possible. As I glanced around the crowded room, the minimal kitchen area and the general lack of facilities, it flashed through my mind that bottle feeding would be the worst thing for the baby. Where on earth would Edith keep bottles and tins of formula milk? How would she sterilise them? Would she bother to? Or even bother to keep them clean, never mind sterilising? There was no refrigerator and I could well imagine bottles of half-consumed milk left lying around the place to be given a second or third time to the baby, with no thought to the fact that bacteria quickly builds up in milk that has been left to go cold and then warmed up again. No, breastfeeding would be much safer, even if there was not quite enough milk. I remember lectures during my Part 1 midwifery training about the advantages of bottle feeding, which sounded very convincing. When I first came to work with the Nonatus midwives, I thought them very old-fashioned. I had not taken into account the social conditions in which the sisters worked. The lecturers were not dealing with real life. They were dealing with classroom situations and ideal young mothers who existed only in the imagination from educated middle-class backgrounds, women who would remember all the rules and do everything they were told to do. These classroom pundits were remote from silly young girls who would get the formula mixed up, get the measurements wrong, fail to boil the water, be unable to sterilise the bottles or the teats, fail to wash the bottles. Such theorists could not even imagine a half-empty bottle being left for twenty-four hours, then given to the baby, 
nor envisage a bottle rolling across the floor picking up cat hairs or any other dirt. Our lecturers never mentioned to us the possibility of anything else being added to the formula, such as sugar, honey, rice, treacle, condensed milk, semolina, alcohol, aspirin, Horlicks, Ovaltine. Perhaps such a possibility had never come their way, but they had been encountered often enough by the nonartus nuns. Edith and her baby looked quite happy, so I did not disturb them, but said I would call the next day to weigh the baby. I had another visit to make to Molly Pierce, a girl of nineteen who was expecting her third baby and who had not turned up at the antenatal clinic for the last three months. As she was very near to full term, we needed to assess her. There was a row going on inside as I approached the door. I've always hated any sort of row or scene, but I had a job to do, so I knocked. Instantly, there was silence inside, and it seemed more menacing than the noise. I knocked again. Still silence. Then a bolt pulled back and a key turned. It was one of the few times I had known a door to be locked in the East End. The unshaven face of a surly-looking man stared suspiciously at me through a crack in the door. Then he swore obscenely, spat at my feet, and made off towards the staircase. The girl looked about nine months pregnant, hot and flushed and panting slightly. Good riddance! she shouted down the balcony and kicked the doorpost. I asked if I could examine her, as she had not been to antenatal clinic. She reluctantly agreed and let me into the flat. The stench inside was overpowering. It was a foul mixture of sweat, urine, feces, cigarettes, alcohol, paraffin, stale food, sour milk and unwashed clothes. Obviously Molly was a real slattern. The vast majority of women that I met had a pride in themselves and their homes and worked desperately hard, but not Molly. She led me into the bedroom, which was dark. The bed was filthy, just a bare mattress and some grey army surplus blankets. A wooden cot stood in the corner. This is no place for a delivery, I thought. It had been assessed as adequate by a midwife some months earlier, but quite obviously the domestic conditions had deteriorated. I would have to report back to the sisters. As Molly lay down, I noticed a great black bruise on her chest. I inquired how it had happened. She snarled and tossed her head. Im, she said, and spat on the floor. I examined her. The baby's head was well down and I could feel movement. The fetal heart was a steady one two six per minute. She and the baby seemed quite normal and healthy in spite of everything. It was only then that I noticed the children. I heard something in the corner of the dark bedroom and nearly jumped out of my skin. I thought it was a rat. I focused my eyes in that direction and saw two little faces peering from behind a chair. Molly said, It's all right. Tom, come here. Two little boys of about two or three years old came out from behind the chair. They were silent. Boys of that age usually rush around, making no end of noise, but not these two. Their silence was unnatural. They had big eyes full of fear, and they took a step or two forward, then clung to each other and retreated behind the chair again. That's all right, kids. It's only the nurse. She won't hurt you. Come here. They came out again. Two dirty little boys, with snot and tear marks staining their faces. They were wearing only jumpers, a practice I had seen a lot in Poplar, and found particularly repellent. A toddler was left naked from the waist down, especially little boys. I was told the women saved on washing this way. The child, before he was toilet trained, could then just urinate anywhere, and there would be no nappies or clothes to wash. Children would run around the tenement balconies and courtyards all day like this. Tom and his little brother crept out from the corner and ran to their mother. They seemed to be losing their fear. She put out an arm affectionately and they cuddled up to her. Well, at least she's got some mothering instincts, I thought. I wondered how much time those little children spent behind the chair when their father was at home. But I was not a health visitor, nor a social worker, and there was no point in speculating. I resolved to report my observations to the sisters, 
and told Molly we would come back later that week to ascertain that everything was available for a home delivery. I still had Muriel to visit, and it was with great relief that I left the foul atmosphere of that flat. The bright cold air outside and the cycle ride down to the Isle of Dogs refreshed my spirits, and I sped along. Hello, lovey. How's yourself? was the greeting shouted at me by several women, known and unknown to me. This was always the greeting called out from the pavement. Lovely, thanks. How's yourself? I always replied. It was difficult not to slip into the Cockney lingo. I don't believe it, I said to myself as I turned into Muriel Street. She can't be here already. Sure enough, Mrs Jenkins was there with her stick and her string bag, her headscarf over her curlers and the same old long mildew-encrusted coat that she wore summer and winter. She was talking to a woman in the street, hanging intently onto every word. She saw me slow down and came and grabbed my sleeve with her filthy long-nailed hands. How is she? And the little one? she rasped. I was impatient and pulled my arm away. Mrs. Jenkins turned up at every delivery. No matter how far the distance, how bad the weather, how early or late in the day, Mrs. Jenkins would always be seen hanging around the street. No one knew where she lived or how she got her information about where a baby had been born, but she always did. I was irritated and passed her without speaking. I regarded her as a nosy old busybody. I was young, too young to understand, to see the pain in her eyes or to hear the tortured urgency in her voice. How is she? And the little one? How's the little one? I went directly into the house without even knocking. Muriel's mother immediately came forward, busy and smiling. She's been asleep since you left. She's been to the toilet and passed water. She's had some tea, and now I'm getting her a nice bit of fish. Baby's been to the breast, but she ain't got no milk yet. I thanked her and went up. The room looked clean and bright with flowers on the chest of drawers. Compared to the squalor of Molly's flat, it looked like paradise. Muriel was awake but sleepy. Her pulse and blood pressure were normal. Her vaginal discharge was not excessive. The uterus felt normal, too. I checked her breasts. A little colostrum was coming out, but no milk. I wanted to try to get the baby to feed. In fact, that was the main purpose of my visit. The helplessness of the newborn human infant has always made an impression on me. Many animals within an hour or two of birth are up on their feet and running. Others, at the very least, can find the nipple and suck, but the human baby can't even do that. If the nipple is not actually placed in the baby's mouth and sucking encouraged, the baby would die of starvation. In the cot, the baby was sleeping soundly. Gone was the puckered appearance, the discoloration of the skin from the stress and trauma of birth, the cries of alarm and fear at entering this world. He was relaxed and warm and peaceful. I lifted the tiny creature and brought him to Muriel. She had started squeezing a little colostrum from the nipple. We tried brushing this over the baby's lips. He was not interested, only squirmed and turned his head away. It took quarter of an hour of patiently trying, but eventually we persuaded him to open his mouth sufficiently to insert the nipple. He took three sucks and went to sleep again, sound asleep, as though exhausted from all his efforts. Muriel and I laughed. You would think he'd been doing all the hard work, she said. Not you and me, eh, nurse? We agreed to leave it for the time being. I would be back in the evening, and she could try again during the afternoon. I bade them goodbye and made for my bicycle. Mrs. Jenkins was standing over it, hanging on to the saddle. How is she? And the little one? How's the little one? She hissed at me, her eyes unblinking. There is something about obsessive behaviour that is off-putting. Mrs. Jenkins was more than that. She was repellent. About seventy, she was tiny and bent, and her black eyes penetrated me, shattering any pleasant thoughts. She was toothless and ugly, in my arrogant opinion, and her filthy claw-like hands were creeping down my sleeve, getting unpleasantly close to my wrists. I pulled myself up to my full height, which was nearly twice hers, and said in a cold, professional voice, Mrs. Smith 
has been safely delivered of a little boy. Mother and baby are both doing well. Now, if you will excuse me, I must go. Thank God, she said, and released my coat sleeve and my bicycle. Crazy old thing, I thought crossly as I rode off. She ought not to be allowed out. It was not until a year later that I learned more about Mrs. Jenkins, and a little humility. End of Disc 1 Call the Midwife, Disc 2 The first time I saw Camilla Fortescue Chumley Brown, just call me Chummy, I thought it was a bloke in drag. Six foot two inches tall, with shoulders like a front row forward and size eleven feet. Chummy arrived the morning after the memorable evening when Sister Monica Joan and I had polished off a cake intended for twelve. Cynthia, Trixie and I were leaving the kitchen after breakfast when the front doorbell rang and this giant in skirts entered. She blinked down at us from behind thick steel-rimmed glasses and said in the plummiest voice imaginable, Is this Nonata's house? Trixie, who had a waspish tongue, looked out into the street. Is there anyone there? she called, and came back into the hallway, bumping into the stranger. Oh, sorry, I didn't notice you, she said, and made off for the clinical room. Cynthia greeted the woman with the same warmth and friendliness that had chased away my thoughts of bolting the night before. You must be Camilla. Oh, just call me Chummy. Oh, all right then, Chummy. Come in, and we'll find Sister Julienne. Chummy picked up her case, took two steps, and tripped over the doormat. Oh, looks clumsy me, she said, with a girlish giggle. She bent down to straighten the mat, and collided with the hall stand, knocking two coats and three hats onto the floor. Frightfully sorry. I'll soon get them. But Cynthia had already picked them up, fearing the worst. Thanks, old bean, <laughs> said Chummy. Strangely enough, for all her massive size, her voice was soft and sweet. In fact, everything about Chummy was soft and sweet. Despite her appearance, she had the nature of a gentle, artless young girl, diffident and shy. The Fortescue Chumley Browns were top-draw county types. Her great-great-grandfather had entered the Indian Civil Service in the 1820s, and the tradition had progressed through the generations. Her father was governor of Rajasthan, which we learnt from the collection of photographs on display in Chummy's room. She was the only girl amongst six brothers. All of them were tall, but unfortunately she was about an inch taller than the rest of the family. All the children had been educated in England, the boys going to Eton and Chummy to Rodine. They were placed in the care of guardians in this country, as the mother remained in India with her husband. Apparently Chummy had been at boarding school since she was six. She clung to her family photographs with touching fervour, and particularly loved one taken with her mother when she was fourteen. That was the holiday I had with Mater, she said proudly, completely unaware of the pathos of her remark. After Rodine came finishing school in Switzerland, then back to London to the Lucy Clayton Charm School to prepare her for presentation at court. Those were the days of debutantes, when the daughters of the best families had to be presented formally to the monarch at Buckingham Palace. Two photographs were proof of the event. In the first, an unmistakable chummy in a ridiculous lacy ball gown with ribbons and flowers stood amongst a group of pretty young girls similarly attired, her huge bony shoulders towering above their heads. The second photo was of her presentation to King George VI. Her great size and angular shape emphasised the petite charm of the Queen and the exquisite beauty of the two princesses, Elizabeth and Margaret. After that came a year at Cordon Bleu School. Chummy learned all the arts of the perfect hostess, but remained ungainly, awkward, oversized, and generally unsuited to hostessing in any society. So a course at the best needlework school in London was deemed to be the right thing for her. For two years, Chummy crocheted, embroidered, tatted, machined, and double-hemmed, all to no avail, while the other girls, feather-stitched and chatted happily or sadly of their boyfriends and lovers, Chummy, liked by all but loved by none, remained silent, always the odd chum out. She never knew how it happened, but suddenly, unsought, she found her vocation. Nursing and God. Chummy was going to be a missionary. In a fever pitch of excitement, 
she enrolled at the Nightingale School of Nursing at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. She was an instant success and won the Nightingale Prize three years in succession. She adored the work on the wards, feeling for the first time in her life confident and competent. Patients loved her, senior staff respected her, junior staff admired her. In spite of her great size, she was gentle, with an intuitive understanding of patients. Even her clumsiness, a hallmark of earlier years, left her. On the wards, she never dropped or broke a thing, never moved awkwardly or crashed into things. All these traits beset her only in social life, for which she remained wholly ill-adapted. Chummy's entry into midwifery was less successful, but no less spectacular. It was some days before she could go out on the district. In the first place, no uniform would fit her. Never mind, I'll make it, she said cheerfully. Sister Julienne doubted if there was a pattern available. Not to worry. Actually, I can make it out of newspaper. To everyone's astonishment, she did. The bicycle was not so easy. For all her genteel education, no one had thought it necessary to teach her to ride a bicycle. A horse, yes, but a bicycle, no. Never mind, I can learn, she said cheerfully. Sister Julienne said it was hard for an adult to acquire the skill. Not to worry, I can practice, was her equally exuberant response. Cynthia, Trixie and I went with her to the bicycle shed and selected the largest, a huge old rally of about 1910 vintage, made of solid iron with high handlebars. The solid tyres were about three inches thick, and there were no gears. The whole contraption weighed about half a ton, and for this reason no one rode it. Trixie oiled the chain, and we were ready for the off. We agreed to push Chummy up and down Leyland Street until she found her balance, after which we would travel in convoy to where the roads were quiet and flat. Most people who have tried to ride a bicycle in adult life for the first time will tell you it is a terrifying experience. Many will say that it is impossible and give up, but Chummy was made of sterner stuff. We pushed her, huge and shaking, shouting, Pedal! Pedal! Up! Down! Up! down until we were exhausted. She weighed about twelve stone of solid bone and muscle and the bike another six stone, but we kept on pushing. At four o'clock, the local children came pouring out of school. About ten of them took over, giving us girls a well-earned rest as they ran along, pushing and shouting encouragement. Several times, Chummy fell heavily. She hit her head on the curb and said, Not to worry, no brains to hurt. She cut her leg and murmured, just a scratch. She fell heavily onto one arm and proclaimed, I have another. She was indomitable. We began to respect her. Even the Cockney children who had seen her as a comic turn changed their tune. A tough-looking cookie of about twelve who had been openly jeering now looked solemnly at her with admiration. The time had come to venture further than Leyland Street. Chummy could balance and she could pedal so we agreed to half an hour cycling around the streets. Trixie was in front, Cynthia and I on either side of Chummy, the children running behind, shouting. We got to the top of Leyland Street, and no further. It had not occurred to us to show Chummy how to turn a corner. Trixie turned left, calling, Just follow me! Cynthia and I turned left, but Chummy kept going straight ahead. I saw her fixed expression as she came straight for me, and after that all was confusion. Apparently a policeman had been in the act of crossing the street when the two of us hurtled into him. We came to rest on the opposite pavement. Seeing a representative of the law hit full frontal by a couple of midwives was joy for the children. They screamed with delight, and doors opened all down the street, emitting even more children and curious adults. I was lying on my back in the gutter, not knowing what had happened. From this position I heard a groan. Then the policeman sat up with the words, What fool did that? I saw Chummy sit up. She had lost her glasses and peered round. Maybe this could account for her next action, or maybe she was dazed. She slapped the man heavily on the back with her huge hand and said, No whinging now. Cheer up, old bean. Stiff upper lip and all that, what? Clearly she was unaware that he was a policeman. 
He was a big man, but not as big as Chummy. He fell forward at the blow, his face hitting one of the bicycles, and he cut his lip. Chummy merely said, Oh, just a little scrat. Nothing to make a fuss about, old sport, and slapped him on the back again. The policeman was outraged. He took out his notebook and licked his pencil. The children vanished. The street cleared. He looked at Chummy with menace. I'll take your name and address. Assaulting a policeman is a serious offence, I'll have you know. I swear it was Cynthia's sexy voice that got us off. Without her, we would have been up before the magistrate the next day. I never knew how she did it, and she was quite unconscious of her charm. She said little, but the man's anger quickly vanished. He picked up the bicycles and escorted us down the street to Donata's house. He left us with the words, Nice meeting you young ladies. I hope we meet again sometime. Chummy had to spend three days in bed. The doctor said she had delayed shock and mild concussion. She slept for the first thirty-six hours, her temperature raised and pulse erratic. On the fourth day, she was able to sit up and asked what had happened. She was horrified when we told her and deeply remorseful. As soon as she could go out, her first visit was to the police station to find the constable she had injured. She took with her a box of chocolates and a bottle of whiskey. When I called at the Canada buildings to reassess Molly for a home confinement, she was out. It took three calls before I found her in. On the second attempt, there was someone in, but the door was locked, and no one came to open it. On the third visit, Molly answered the door. She looked dreadful. She was pale and haggard. Lank, greasy hair hung down her dirty face, and the two filthy little boys clung to her skirt. A glance around the room showed that the domestic situation was worse. I told her it would be better if she went into hospital for the delivery. She shrugged, seeming indifferent. I pointed out that she had been to no antenatal clinics and that this could be dangerous. She shrugged again. I was getting nowhere. I said, How is it that four months ago the midwives assessed your place as satisfactory for a home confinement, and now it is not? She said, Well, me mum come in and cleaned up, didn't she? At last, some communication. There was a mother on the scene, and her address was in the next block. Good. The Canada buildings, named Ontario, Baffin, Hudson, Ottawa, and so on, were six blocks of densely populated tenements lying between Blackwall Tunnel and Blackwall Stairs. It was said there were 5,000 people living in the buildings. They were six stories high and very primitive, with a tap and a lavatory at the end of each balcony. It was beyond me how anyone could live there and maintain cleanliness or self-respect. I found her mother Marjorie's address in the Ontario buildings and knocked. A cheery voice called, Come on in, lovey, the usual invitation of an East Ender, whoever you were. The door was unlocked, so I stepped straight into the main room. Marjorie turned round as I entered with a bright smile. The smile vanished as soon as she saw me. Oh, no, not again. You've come about our mall, haven't you? She sat down, buried her face in her hands and sobbed. I was embarrassed. I didn't know what to say. In fact, the more emotional people get, the less I am able to cope. I sat down beside her. Having seen Molly's squalor, I had expected to see her mother's place in the same condition, but the room was clean and tidy and smelt nice. Pretty curtains hung at clean windows. A kettle was bubbling on the gas stove. Marjorie was wearing a clean dress and pinafore. Her hair was brushed and looked nice. The kettle gave me an idea, and as the sobs lessened, I said, How about making a nice cup of tea for us both? I'm parched. She brightened up and said with typical Cockney courtesy, Sorry, nurse, don't mind me. I gets that worked up about Moll, I do. Making the tea helped her sniff away the tears. Over the next twenty minutes, it all came out her hopes and her heartache. Molly was the last of five children. She had never known her father, who had been killed at Arnhem during the war. The whole family had been evacuated to Gloucestershire. Marjorie said, I don't know if that upset her or what, but the others turned out all right, they did. The family returned to London. Molly seemed to adapt and was doing well at her new school. 
She was that bright, Marjorie said. Always top of the class. She could have been a secretary in an office up west, she could. Oh, it breaks my heart when I thinks on it. She sniffed and pulled out her handkerchief. She was about fourteen when she met that turd. His name's Richard, and I calls him Richard the Turd. When she was sixteen, she said she was going to marry her dick. I reckoned as how she was pregnant anyhow, so I says, that's the best thing you can do, my lovey. They married and took two rooms in Baffin buildings. From the start, Molly never did any housework, but they seemed happy and although Dick did not appear to be in any regular job, Marjorie hoped for the best for her daughter. Their first baby was born, and quite soon afterwards, Marjorie noticed bruises on her daughter's neck and arms, a cut above her eye, a limp on one occasion. Each time Molly said she had fallen down. Marjorie began to have her suspicions, but relations between her and Dick, never cordial, were breaking down. He hates me, she said and won't never let me come near her or the boys. There's not nothing I can do. I don't know what's worse, knowing he hits me daughter or knowing he hits the kids. The best time was when he'd done six months inside. Then I knew they was safe. She started crying again, and I asked her if social services could do anything to help. No, she won't say a word against him. He's got such a hold on her. I felt deeply sorry for this poor woman and her silly daughter, but most of all I felt sorry for the little boys, and now a third child was coming. Marjorie burst into tears again. I'd do anything in the world for her and the kiddies, but the turd, he won't let me go near them. It was a tricky situation, and I reported back to the sisters. A hospital confinement was arranged, and I thought that would be the last we heard of Molly. It was not to be. About three weeks later, the midwives received a phone call from Poplar Hospital asking if we could arrange postnatal visits for Molly, who had discharged herself and the baby on the third day after delivery. This was almost unprecedented. In those days, it was accepted by medical and lay people alike that a new mother should stay in bed for two weeks. Apparently, Molly had walked home carrying the baby, and this was considered very dangerous. Sister Bernadette went straight round to Baffin Buildings. She reported back that Molly was there, looking a good deal cleaner, but as sullen as ever. Dick was not at home. He was supposed to have been looking after the children whilst Molly was in hospital, but whether he had or not was anyone's guess. Marjorie had offered to take care of them, but Dick had refused, saying they were his kids, and he wasn't going to let that interfering old bag poke her nose into his family. There had been no food in the flat. Perhaps Molly had anticipated this, and that was why she discharged herself. On the way home with the baby, she had called in the cooked meat shop and begged a couple of meat pies on tick. As the butcher respected her mother, he let Molly have them. The two little boys, dressed only in filthy jumpers, were sitting on the floor, devouring the pies ravenously when Sister Bernadette arrived. Molly hardly spoke, Sister told us. She had submitted to her and the baby, a little girl, being examined, but remained morosely silent. Sister had said she was going to tell Marjorie that her daughter was home. Please yourself, was all the reply she got. Marjorie had had no idea of the turn of events and ran round to Baffin Building straight away. Unfortunately, Dick chose the same moment to return, and they met on the landing. He lunged at her drunkenly, and Marjorie ducked. Had he hit her, she would have fallen down the stone staircase. After that, all the poor woman dared do was leave food outside her daughter's door. Our custom was to visit twice a day for fourteen days after delivery. Molly and Baby were satisfactory from a purely medical point of view, but the domestic situation was as bad as ever. Sometimes Dick was at home, sometimes not. Poor Marjorie was never allowed in. Over the next few days, several nurses visited Molly, all reporting the same disquieting condition. One nurse said she was very nearly sick in the room and had to rush outside into the fresh air in order to control her stomach. On the eighth evening, I called, and there was no reply to my knock. The door was locked, and as it was only 5 p.m., I continued my visits, intending to return later. It was about 8 p.m. when I got back to Baffin Buildings. 
I was tired, and it seemed a long climb up to the fifth floor. I knocked, and there was no reply again. I knocked again, louder. A door opened just down the balcony, and a woman appeared. She's out, she said, her fag drooping off her lower lip. Out? You can't mean it. She's only just had a baby. Well, she's out, I tells you. I saw her go, I did, tarted up and all she was. Well, where's she gone to? It flashed through my mind that she had gone to her mother's. Has she taken the children? The woman uttered a shriek of laughter, and the fag dropped to the floor. She stooped to pick it up, and her hair curlers clacked together as she bent. What? <laughs> Three kids? You must be joking. Three kids wouldn't do her much good, would it now? I didn't like the woman. There was something about the knowing way she grinned at me that was most unpleasant. I turned my back on her, knocked again, and called through the letterbox. Would you let me in, please? It's the nurse. There was a movement inside. I heard it quite distinctly. I kneeled down and looked through the letterbox. Two eyes met my gaze. They were a child's eyes, and they stared at me for about ten seconds, then vanished. This enabled me to see into the room. A faint greenish-blue light came from an unguarded paraffin stove. A pram stood nearby. I saw one little boy running across the room. The other was sitting in a corner. I caught my breath sharply. The woman must have heard it. She said, I told you she was out, didn't I? I felt I must take this woman into my confidence. She might be able to help. We can't leave the three children alone with that paraffin heater. If one of them knocks it over, they'll be burnt to death. If Molly's out, where's the father? The woman drew closer. She clearly enjoyed being the bearer of bad news. He's a bad lot, that dick he is. You mark my words. You don't want to have nothing to do with him. He's no good to her, and she's no better than she should be. Oh, it's a shame, I cut her short. That paraffin heater is a death trap. I'm going to inform the police. We've got to get in there. Her eyes gleamed. You gonna call the police, then? Go! She dashed off down the balcony and knocked on another door, bearing the news. Tiredness had left me, and I sped down the stairs and ran to the nearest phone box. The police said they would come at once. Marjorie had to be informed, I decided, so my next call was Ontario Buildings. Poor woman. When I told her, she crumpled as though I had hit her. Oh, no, I can't bear any more, she moaned. I guessed as much. She's gone on the game, then. So innocent was I that I didn't know what she meant. What game, I said, thinking she meant darts or billiards or gambling in a local pub. Marjorie looked at me compassionately. Never you mind, Ducky. You don't need to know about that sort of thing. I must go and see after them kiddies. We went together. The police were already at the door, working on the lock. I had thought they would bring a locksmith, but no. Most policemen are expert at picking locks. Do they learn it in college, I wondered? A crowd had gathered on the balcony. No one wanted to miss a thing. Marjorie stepped forward, saying she was the grandmother, and when the door was opened, she was the first to enter. The police and I followed. The room was suffocatingly hot, and the stench putrid. The children were not to be seen, apart from the baby, who was blissfully asleep. She looked surprisingly well cared for, clean and well fed. The rest of the room was indescribable. It was full of flies, and a heap of excrement and dirty nappies in a corner was crawling with maggots. Marjorie went into the bedroom, gently calling the boys' names. They were behind the chair. She took them in her arms, tears streaming down her face. Never mind, my lovies. Nana's got you. At that moment there was a commotion outside and Dick appeared in the doorway. Obviously he had not known that the police were in his flat. As soon as he saw them he turned to run, but his path was barred by the onlookers. They had let him in, but they were not going to let him out again. Perhaps there were scores to be settled between Dick and his neighbours. He was told by the police that he would be cautioned about the neglect of three children under the age of five. He swore, spat, and said, What's wrong with them? Kids are all right? Nothing wrong, far as I can see. It's a very good thing for you that there is nothing wrong. 
Leaving them alone with a paraffin heater alight and unguarded would have caused a fire if one of the children had knocked it over. Dick started to whine. That's not my fault. I didn't put the heater on. The missus did. I didn't know she'd gone out and left it. The lazy slut. I'll give her what for when I sees her. The policeman said. Where is your wife? How should I know? Marjorie shouted at him. You villain! You know where she is! And you made her go, didn't you, you swine? Dick was all innocence. What's the old cow on about now? Marjorie was about to scream a reply, but the policeman stopped her. You can settle your differences when we have gone. We have put it on record that you have been cautioned about leaving your children unattended and in a dangerous situation. If it occurs again, you will be charged. Dick was all wheedling charm. Oh, you can take it from me. This will never occur again, officer. I apologise and will see it never happens again. The police prepared to leave. Dick said, pointing to Marjorie, And you can take her with you and all. She gave an anguished cry and held the two little boys closer to her. She appealed to the policeman. I can't leave them here. Can't you see? I can't leave them like this. Dick said in a soothing, cheery voice, Don't you worry, old lady, I can look after me kids, there's nothing to worry about. Then to the policeman, You can leave them safe with me, you got my word for it. Neither of the policemen were taken in for a moment by this display of paternal devotion, but they had no power to do anything but caution him. One of them turned to Marjorie, You can only stay here if you are invited and you certainly cannot take the children away without the father's consent. Dick was triumphant. You heard? You've got to have the father's consent, and I'm the father and I don't consent, see? Now get out! After the accident, Sister Julianne was seriously in doubt as to whether Chummy could master the skills of riding a bicycle. But Chummy was adamant she could and would learn. Every spare minute of her time was spent practising. She would push the old rally up Leyland Street, a slight incline, and then freewheel down, up and down hundreds of times, until she acquired her balance. She got up a couple of hours early each morning and went out every evening from about eight to ten, coming back exhausted and breathless. Well, actually, there's no point in just learning to ride in the daylight, she argued gaily with irrefutable logic. These rides in the dark were usually accompanied by crowds of cheering or jeering children. This might have been a menace had Chummy not gained the respect of an older lad who had joined us on that first day when Cynthia, Trixie and I had been trying to teach her. Jack was a particularly tough specimen of about thirteen, accustomed to fighting for his rights. He soon dispersed the little kids. A few blows, a few kicks, and they were gone. Then he presented himself in front of the bicycle, her champion. You gets any more trouble from that lot, miss, just call me. Jack, I'll take care of them. Oh, that's frightfully good of you, Jack. Actually, I'm most awfully grateful. This old machine's a lively little filly, what? Chummy's posh voice must have been as incomprehensible to Jack as his cockney accent was to her, but nevertheless they struck a friendship then and there. After that, Chummy learned rapidly. Jack was out early and late, running, pushing, helping her in every way. He developed an ingenious way of teaching her to turn corners. He pedalled whilst she steered. Chummy controlled the handlebars sitting on the saddle, her legs trailing, whilst he stood on the pedals doing all the hard work. To propel her twelve-stone weight must have been hard work indeed. But Jack was no puny thirteen-year-old and took pride in his manliness. Early and late, he could be heard shouting, Turn left, miss! No left, you daffy! Easy does it, not too sharp now. Aim for that phone box and keep your eyes on it. Neither of them saw defeat as a possibility, and within three weeks they were riding all the way from Bow to the Isle of Dogs in the dark November mornings. Jack did not own a bicycle, and reluctantly he had to admit that the time had come for Chummy to try on her own. He pushed her off, and she pedalled confidently down the street and round the corner. Sadly, he waved as she turned out of sight. He had been useful, 
and now the fun was over. He slouched off homewards, hands in pockets. But Chummy was not one to let a friendship die, still less to allow kindness and help to pass unnoticed. She discussed it with us at lunch, and we agreed that a gift of some sort would be appropriate. Various were the suggestions, a jar of sweets, a football, a penknife, but Chummy was not happy with any of these ideas. Sister Julienne, ever practical and wise, pointed out that the time, effort and commitment on Jack's part had been very great, so therefore her debt to him was great. I don't think the boy should be fobbed off with a trivial token. I feel he should receive something that he really wants and would value. On the other hand, it depends entirely upon what you, the giver, can afford, and only you can know this. Chummy brightened, and a huge smile lit her features. Actually, I know what Jack wants more than anything else. A bicycle. And I'm pretty sure Peter would buy one for him if I explained the circumstances. What? He's a sporting old stick, and always coughs up for a good cause. I'll write to him tonight. Of course, Peter coughed up, happy to see his only daughter fulfilled at last. A new bicycle meant a new life for Jack. Very few boys had such a possession in those days. For him, it meant freedom. He was an adventurous boy and went miles beyond the East End on his bike. He joined the Dagenham Cycling Club and competed in time trials and road races. He went camping in the Essex countryside. He went as far as the coast and saw the sea for the first time. Chummy was delighted, and his continued friendship was her greatest joy. He seemed to feel she needed his protection, and so every day after school Jack would turn up at Nanata's house to escort her on her evening visits. His instinct that the children of the docks would torment her were right, because on the whole the Cockneys did not take to Chummy and made fun of her. A huge size, pedalling steadily along the streets on an ancient solid-wheeled bicycle, brought crowds of children shouting things like, what -o! and Jolly good show, actually, and Steady on, old bean, amid loud-mouthed guffaws, and to rub salt into the wound, they called her the Hippo. Poor Chummy treated it with good humour, but we all knew how deeply it hurt her. But when tough, pugnacious, streetwise Jack was with her, the children kept their distance. We all saw him on different occasions, standing in the street or the tenement courtyards, holding two bicycles, his lower jaw thrust forward, his stocky legs slightly apart, coolly looking around him, confident that a look was all that was needed to protect Miss. Twenty-five years later, a shy young girl called Lady Diana Spencer became engaged to marry Prince Charles, heir to the throne. I saw several film clips of her arriving at various engagements. Each time, when the car stopped, the front near-side door would open and her bodyguard would step out and open the rear door for Lady Diana. Then he would stand, jaw thrust forward, legs slightly apart, and look coolly around him at the crowds. A mature Jack, still practising the skills he had acquired in childhood, looking after his lady. Betty Smith's baby was due in early February but she dashed happily around all December, preparing Christmas for her husband and six children, her parents and in-laws, grandparents on both sides, brothers, sisters and their children, uncles and aunts, and a very ancient great-grandmother. Dave was a wharf manager in the West India docks. He was in his thirties, clever and competent, knew his job inside out and earned a good wage. In consequence, the family was able to live in one of the large Victorian houses just off Commercial Road. Betty loved her big, roomy house, and had always been glad to have the family descend on her for Christmas. The children loved it, with about twenty-five little cousins coming from all over Poplar, Stepney, Bow and Canning Town, they were going to have a high old time. But this year, things were to be rather different. My Christmas was also very different. We were having lunch around the big table on Christmas Day when the telephone rang. Everyone groaned. We had hoped for a day of rest. The nurse who answered it came back to say that Dave Smith was reporting that his wife seemed to be in labour. The groan turned into a gasp of anxiety. Sister Bernadette jumped up. 
I'll go and talk to him. She came back a few minutes later and said, It sounds as though it is labour. At thirty-four weeks this is unfortunate. I have informed Dr. Turner and he will come at once if we need him. Who is on call today? I was. We prepared to go out together. I was a student at the time and was always accompanied by a trained midwife. Together we left the cosy warmth of an excellent Christmas dinner and fetched a delivery pack and our midwifery bags from the sterilising room. We fitted them to our bicycles and pushed out into a cold, windless day. I had never known London to be so quiet. Nothing seemed to stir except for two midwives cycling along the deserted road. Normally the East India Dock Road is dense with heavy goods vehicles going to and from the docks, but on that day the broad thoroughfare looked majestic and beautiful in its silence. Nothing moved on the river or in the docks, not a sound but the occasional cry of a seagull. The stillness of the great heart of London was unforgettable. We arrived at the house and Dave let us in. About a dozen little faces of curious children were pressed to the window as we arrived. We saw a big Christmas tree, a fire, and a room crowded with people. Dave said, Betty's upstairs. She don't want to send them home. She likes a bit of noise, says it'll help her. The sound of lusty singing of Old MacDonald Had a Farm came from the front room, accompanied by an out-of-tune piano. Full vocal justice was given to the animal noises by various uncles. Children screamed with laughter and shouted for more. We went upstairs to Betty's room, where the peace and silence contrasted with the clamour below. A fire had been lit and was burning brightly. Hardly any time had been given to Betty's mother to prepare a delivery room, but she had worked miracles. Surfaces had been cleaned, extra linen provided, hot water was available, even the cot had been prepared. Betty's first words were, This is a turn up for the book, say, sister. She was a cheerful, down-to-earth woman who took everything in her stride. I opened the delivery pack and covered the bed with brown waterproof paper, then the draw sheets and maternity pads. We gowned and scrubbed up, and sister examined her. The waters had broken an hour earlier. I saw intense concentration on sister's face, then a look of grave concern. She said gently, Betty, your baby seems to be a breech presentation. That means the bottom is coming first instead of the head. This is a perfectly normal way for the baby to lie until about thirty-five weeks, but then the baby usually turns and the head is presented first. Your baby has not turned. Now, whilst thousands of babies are born quite safely in breach, there is a greater risk than a head presentation. Perhaps you should consider a hospital delivery. Betty's reaction was immediate and dogmatic. No. No hospital. I'll be okay with you, sister. All me babies have been delivered by the Nanartans and born in this room and I don't want nothing else. What do you say, Mum? Her mother agreed and recalled that her ninth had been a breach and that her neighbour Glad had had no less than four arse first. Sister said, Very well, then, we will do our best, but I'm going to ask Dr Turner to come. Then to me, Would you go and ring him, nurse? As I went downstairs, a stream of shouting children in paper hats, faces alight with excitement, rushed past me, screaming and pushing. A voice from downstairs called out, Everyone hide, I'll count twenty, then I'm coming to find you. One, two, three, four. I went out into the cold of the deserted street to find the telephone box. Dr. Turner was a general practitioner who not only had a surgery in the East End, but also lived there with his wife and children. He was utterly dedicated to his work, and it seemed to me that he was always on call. Like most GPs of his generation, he was a first-class midwife. He was expecting my call. I told him the facts. He said, thank you, nurse. I will come directly. Back in the house, hide-and-seek was still going on. The noise was terrific as children were found. As I entered the door, a cheery-faced man passed me carrying a crate of empty beer bottles. How about joining me for one then, nurse, he said. You and sister and all. Whoops, does she drink, do you think? I assured him that the sisters did drink, but not on duty, and that for the same reason I would not do so either. A paper streamer shot past my ear, blown by an invisible figure behind a door. 
Oh, sorry, nurse. I thought it was our pole. I unraveled the pink and orange thing from my uniform and went upstairs. Betty's room was wonderfully quiet and peaceful. The thick old walls and heavy wooden door insulated the sounds, and Betty looked calm and content. Sister Bernadette was writing up her notes, and Betty's mother Ivy was sitting in the corner knitting. Dr. Turner arrived, looking as though there was nothing in the world he would rather do on Christmas Day than attend a breach delivery. He and Sister conferred, and he examined Betty thoroughly. I expected him to do another vaginal examination, but he did not. He accepted Sister's diagnosis without question. He told Betty that she and her baby seemed very well, and he would come back at 5 p.m. unless we called him earlier. We sat down to wait. Much of a midwife's work involves intense, often dramatic activity, but this is balanced by long periods of waiting quietly. Sister took out her breviary in order to say the office of the day. The nuns lived by the monastic rules of the six offices. Lords, Tius, Sext, Known, Vespers, Compline and Holy Communion each morning. In a contemplative community, the offices together occupy about five hours of prayer time. For a working community, this is impracticable. So in the early days of their vocation, the midwives of St. Raymond Nonatus had had a shortened version devised for them. Thus they were able to maintain their religious life and work full-time as nurses and midwives. The sight of this fair young face in the firelight, reading the ancient prayers, turning the pages quietly and reverently, her lips moving as she read, was deeply affecting. I sat watching her and marvelled at the depth of a vocation that could make such a pretty young woman renounce life with all its fun and opportunities for a religious life bound by the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. I could understand the vocation to nursing and midwifery, which to me were fascinating, but the calling to a religious life was quite beyond my comprehension. Betty groaned as a contraction came on. Sister smiled and went over to her. She returned to her breviary, and all that could be heard in the room was the tick of a big clock and the click of Ivy's knitting needles. Beyond the door, the sounds of the party continued, but within the room all was calm and prayerful. The time ticked quietly by. The sounds of ay 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 conga came from below. They went round and round the sitting room. Then the noise got louder and louder as the snake of people started coming up the stairs. Sister thought the noise might bother Betty, but she said, No, no, sister, I likes to hear it. I wouldn't want this house to be quiet, not on Christmas Day like. Sister smiled. The last few contractions had seemed stronger and were closer together. She got up and examined Betty and said to me, I think you had better go and call Dr. Turner, if you please, nurse. It was four o'clock when I rang him, and Dr. Turner arrived within a quarter of an hour. I was excited. This was my first breach delivery. Betty was beginning to feel the urge to push. Sister Bernadette said, You must try very hard not to push at first, dear. Breathe deeply and try to relax, but not to push. We gowned, masked, and scrubbed up again. Doctor looked at Sister Bernadette and said, You take this delivery, Sister. I'll be here if you need me. He obviously had complete confidence in her. She nodded and told Betty she wanted her to remain on her back, with her buttocks over the end of the bed, and she asked me and Ivy to hold a leg each. I was learning, so Sister explained everything she did clearly and carefully. I could see something coming as the perineum expanded, but it did not look like a baby's buttocks. It looked a purplish colour. Sister saw my questioning expression and told me, That is the prolapsed cord. It occurs quite commonly in a breech delivery, because the breech is an incomplete sphere, and the cord can easily slip down between the baby's legs. As long as it is pulsating normally, there is nothing to worry about. The perineum continued to distend, and now I saw the baby's buttocks quite clearly. Sister was kneeling on the floor between Betty's legs, because the bed was too low for her to stand. She was explaining everything in a low voice to me. This is a left sacro-anterior position, which means the left buttock will be born first from under the pubic bone. 
Now, don't push, Betty, she continued. I want this baby to come slowly. The slower, the better. The baby's legs will be curled up. I will want to rotate the baby to ensure the best position for delivery, but also the pull of gravity as the baby's body hangs from the vulva will help to maintain flexion of the head. This will be important. The buttocks were born, and with infinite care, Sister inserted a hand and hooked her fingers over the flexed legs. Don't push, Betty, whatever you do, said Sister Bernadette. The legs slid out easily. It was a little girl. A long section of cord also slid out. It was pulsating quite vigorously. The baby is still fully attached to the placenta, Sister said, and its lifeblood is coming through the cord. Even though the body is half-born, until the nose and mouth are clear to breathe, the baby depends upon the placenta and this cord for life. I found it spooky that this tortuous, pulsating thing was absolutely essential to life, and said, shouldn't we push it back? Not necessary. Some midwives do, but I really think there is no advantage to be gained. Another contraction came, and with it the baby's body slid out as far as the shoulders. Towels had been placed over the screen by the fire to warm. Sister asked for one and wrapped it firmly around the baby's body. The purpose of this is twofold. Firstly, the baby must not be allowed to get cold. Most of her body is now exposed, and if the shock of cold air makes her gasp, she will inhale amniotic fluid, which could be fatal. Secondly, the towel gives me something to grip hold of. The baby is slippery, and I have to turn her another one-quarter circle, so the occiput will be under the pubic bone. I will do this as I deliver the shoulders. With the next contraction, the left anterior shoulder impinged upon the pelvic floor, and Sister delivered it by hooking a finger under the arm and at the same time rotating the body a little clockwise. The right shoulder was delivered in the same manner, and both babies' arms were out. Only the head remained inside the mother. You have a little girl, Sister said to Betty, but from the size of her limbs I don't think she is six weeks premature. I think you got your dates wrong. I want you, Betty, to push now with all your strength and really use every contraction for delivery of the baby's head. Doctor may have to exert some suprapubic pressure, but I would prefer it if you could push the head out by yourself. There had been no contractions for a full three minutes, and I was beginning to feel tense and anxious, but Sister was relaxed. The baby was supported by her hands. Then she let go completely, so it was hanging quite unsupported. I gasped in horror. This is the correct thing to do, Sister explained. The weight of the baby's body will gently pull the head down a little, and it will increase the flexion of the head, which is what I want. About thirty seconds like this will be enough. It will not hurt the baby. Then she took hold of the baby again. I must say I felt relieved. A contraction came on. Now, push, Betty, as hard as possible. Betty did, but the head did not descend any more. Sister and Dr. Turner agreed that with the next contraction he would exert suprapubic pressure, and if that did not prove effective, a low forceps delivery of the head would be necessary. Sister explained to me, That is because the cord will be compressed between the head and the sacral bones. The baby is all right at the moment, but if it goes on for too long, that is, more than a few minutes, there is a definite risk of asphyxia. I clenched my fingers with shock and anxiety, but Sister remained completely calm. Another contraction came, and the doctor placed his hands on Betty's abdomen just above the pubic bone and pressed down firmly. Betty groaned with pain, but there was a definite movement of the head. I am going to use the Morisot Smelly Vite method of extraction of the head, Sister explained to me. She was allowing the baby to hang unsupported again, and my heart was in my mouth. With the next contraction, all being well, we will have the airways clear and the baby will be able to breathe. I will want my Sim's vaginal speculum. I looked to see where the Sim's was on her delivery tray. My hands were trembling. Another contraction came on, and the doctor exerted the same pressure on Betty's abdomen. 
Sister placed her right hand over the shoulders of the baby and the fingers of her left hand into the vagina. I could see her gently moving her fingers and feeling for something. The baby was resting on her forearm. I am trying to hook my index finger into the mouth of the baby in order to maintain flexion of the head so that the mouth and nose will be the first part of the head to encounter the air. It is not to exert pressure by pulling. If you ever use this method of delivery, nurse, remember that. If you try pulling, you risk dislocating the jaw. I felt sick with fear and just hoped to God that I would never have to deliver a breach. I could see that she was manipulating the back of the skull with her right hand. She explained, I am simply pushing upwards on the occipital protuberance of the skull to increase flexion. A little more pressure, please, doctor, if you can, and I shall have the airways clear. That's it. The sims, please, nurse. I had to grip my wrist with my other hand to stop it trembling. All I could think was, I mustn't drop it. I mustn't drop it. My relief when I handed it over was so great, I almost laughed. But there was more to see. The chin of the baby was now on the perineum, and Sister carefully inserted the speculum into the vagina, pushing the posterior wall backwards, rather like using a shoehorn, so the baby's nose and mouth were exposed. She asked for a swab which I handed to her, and she wiped the baby's nose and mouth free of mucus. Now she will be able to breathe, and will no longer be dependent upon the placental blood supply. It was astonishing to hear a gasp followed by a tiny cry. The baby's face could not be seen, yet her voice could be heard. That's what I like to hear, said Sister. Did you hear that, Betty? Not half. Is she all right, poor little thing? I reckon as how she's going through it as much as what I am. Yes, your baby's quite safe now, and with the next contraction she will be born, I assure you. I think you have a torn perineum, but I can't see it because it's behind the speculum. Another contraction was coming. This is it, I thought, with some relief. Delivery of the head had so far taken only twelve minutes, but it had seemed like an eternity. The contraction was strong, and the doctor was exerting considerable pressure. Sister drew the baby's body downwards until the nose was level with the perineum and then swiftly upwards over the mother's abdomen. The movement took no more than twenty seconds and the head was delivered. I nearly sobbed with relief. The baby was blue. Sister held her upside down by the ankles. This blue tinge is not serious. It is to be expected. I must make quite sure the airways are clear. When she starts to breathe strongly and regularly, the colour will improve. Pass me the mucus catheter, please. I was not trembling any more, so was able to do this without fear of dropping it. Sister inverted the baby and held her in her left arm. She then inserted the catheter into the baby's mouth and sucked very gently at the other end to draw any fluid or mucus away. One could hear a bubbling sound as fluid entered the catheter. She then cleared each nostril in the same way. The baby gave two or three big gasps and coughed, then cried. In fact, she let out a tremendous scream. Her colour rapidly changed to pink. That's a lovely noise, observed Sister. A few more screams like that will make me happy. The baby obliged and screamed lustily. The cord was clamped and cut, and the baby wrapped in warm, dry towels and handed to Betty. Oh, she's lovely, exclaimed Betty. Bless her little heart. She's worth all the pain in the world. It's a miracle, I thought. The mother literally forgets the agony she has been through the moment she holds her baby. It's Christmas Day, remarked Betty. We must call her Carol. That's a lovely name, said Sister. Now we must get the placenta out. And I think you had better stay where you are, because there is a tear, as I thought, and it will be easier for the doctor to stitch you up in this position. Doctor was drawing up a syringe and said to Sister, I'm going to give the ergometrin now to promote the expulsion of the placenta. She nodded. I did not ask why. 
It was not normal practice to give ergometrin in those days, unless there was undue delay of the third stage or severe bleeding or an incomplete placenta. As I noted earlier, oxytocic drugs may be given routinely today, immediately after delivery of the baby. Within a couple of minutes a contraction came on and the placenta plopped out into the kidney dish held by the sister. Right, I'll hand over to you, doctor, she said. You can take my place now. This was easier said than done, though. Sister tried to get up, but couldn't. She gave a gasp of pain. My legs! I can't feel them. I've got pins and needles. Not surprising, poor thing. She had been kneeling on the floor for over half an hour in the same position, concentrating wholly on the work she was doing. I can't move. You'll have to help me. My legs have completely gone to sleep. The gallant doctor put his arms round her and pulled. She must have been a dead weight because he made no impression. Ivy and I joined in, pushing and pulling. We were all laughing. Eventually, we hoisted Sister to her feet and got her moving her legs until she was able to stand without help. The doctor scrubbed up again. He asked me to hold his torch so he had a direct light on the tear. He anaesthetized the area with a local. It's not too bad, Betty. I'll soon have you stitched up and it will have healed within a couple of weeks. I want to examine you internally, though, to make sure that the cervix is not torn also, because this can sometimes happen in a breech delivery. He inserted two fingers into the vagina and felt all round. He explained to me, The breech is smaller in diameter than the head. Therefore, the cervix may be sufficiently dilated to allow the passage of the breech, but not relatively open enough to allow the free passage of the head. This will obviously be one of the occasions when the cervix may tear. If that occurs, the mother will have to be transferred to hospital because I do not have the facilities here to repair a cervix. However, he continued in a confident voice, you are lucky, Betty. There is nothing torn inside. I just have to put a few stitches on the outside. He selected his cap gut and needle. He pulled the muscle together with forceps and with a few circular movements of the wrist had made a neat repair. It only took a few minutes. Meantime, Sister had been examining the baby. She weighs five and a half pounds, Betty. Your little Carol is certainly not six weeks premature. You must have been a month out with your dates. You must keep a better record next time. Next time? exclaimed Betty. That's a good one. There won't be a next time. One breach delivery is enough for me. The baby was out of danger and the mother comfortable, and so Sister Bernadette and the doctor prepared to leave. I was left to clear up, bath the baby, and write up the notes. On her way downstairs, Sister had to shout through the crowd in order to tell Dave that he had a little daughter. We in the delivery room heard the shouts of congratulations and the strains of, for he's a jolly good fellow. Who's a jolly good fella, said Betty. Dave? Well, I like the sauce. She cuddled her baby happily and laughed. It was seven o'clock by the time I had packed up and was ready to leave, but Dave wouldn't let me go. Come on, nurse, it's Christmas Day. You gotta wet the baby's head. I accepted a Guinness and a mince pie. I didn't really want to hang around. The delivery had been a beautiful Christmas experience, but the party was not my scene. I had loved hearing it in the background, but to be in the midst of all those buxom, hiccuping aunts with their paper hats and red-faced, sweating uncles was more than I could take at that moment. I just wanted to be alone. Out in the street, after the excessive warmth of the delivery room, the cold cut me like a knife. It was a cloudless night, and the stars shone brightly. A heavy frost had descended in all its beauty, covering the black stones of the pavements, the walls, the houses, even my bicycle. I shivered and decided I must pedal very hard to keep warm. Only a mile or two away from Nanata's house, a sudden impulse made me turn right into West Ferry Road and onto the Isle of Dogs. To go all the way round the Isle before rejoining the East India Dock Road is a seven or eight mile ride, and I can't tell you what prompted me to do it. No one was about. The ships in port were silent. The splash of the water was the only sound as I cycled over the West Ferry Bridge. On the Isle there were no lights, apart from the starlight and the Christmas tree lights in the windows of houses. The great majestic Thames was on my right, 
closely guarding all its secrets. I cycled more slowly, as though afraid to break the spell. As I turned westwards, a low moon started to rise, and a silver path shone across the river from Greenwich to my feet. I had to stop my bicycle. It looked as though I could have walked on silvered feet from the north to the south bank of the Thames. Large families may be the norm, but this is ridiculous, I mused as I ran through my day list. The 24th baby? There must be some mistake. My suspicions were confirmed when I got out the surgery notes. Only 42 years old. It was impossible. I'm glad someone else can make mistakes as well as me, I thought. Mrs. Conchita Warren is an unusual name, I thought, as I cycled towards Limehouse to make an antenatal visit. Most local women were Doris, Winnie, Ethel, pronounced F, or Gertie. But Conchita? What was a Conchita doing in the grey streets of Limehouse? I turned off the main road into the little streets and located the house. It was one of the better larger houses, on three floors and with a basement leading into a garden. That would mean seven rooms in all. Promising. I knocked on the door, but no one came. There seemed to be a good deal of noise inside, so I knocked harder. No reply. Nothing for it but to walk in. The narrow hallway was almost impassable. Two ladders and three large coach prams lined the wall. In one, a baby of about eight months slept serenely. The second was full of washing. The third contained coal. Prams were very large in those days, with huge wheels and high protective sides, and I had to turn sideways to squeeze past. Washing flapped overhead and I pushed it aside. The stairway to the first floor was straight ahead and also festooned with washing. The sickly smell of soap, dank washing, baby's excreta, milk, all combined with cooking smells, was nauseating to me. The noise was coming from the basement, yet I could see no steps down. I entered the first room off the hallway. This was what my grandmother would have called the best parlour, filled with her best furniture, knick-knacks, pictures, and, of course, the piano. It was only used on Sundays and special occasions. But if this fine room had ever been anyone's best parlour, the proud housewife would have wept to see it. Half a dozen washing lines were attached to the picture rail below the cornices of a beautifully plastered ceiling. Washing hung from each of them. Light filtered through a single faded curtain nailed across the window, screening the room from the street. The wooden floor was covered with what looked like junk. Broken radios, prams, furniture, toys, a pile of logs, a sack of coal, the remains of a motorcycle, engineering tools, engine oil and petrol. Apart from all this, there were scores of tins of household paints on a bench, brushes, rollers, cloths, pots of spirit, bottles of thinners, rolls of wallpaper, pots of glue, and another ladder. There was a new Singer sewing machine on a long table. Dressmaking patterns, pins, scissors, and cotton were scattered all over the table, and also, quite unbelievably, some very fine, expensive silk. Next to the table stood a dressmaker's model. Also hard to believe, a piano stood against one of the walls. My eyes were riveted by the maker's name. Steinway. I couldn't believe it. A Steinway in a house like this. I wanted to rush over and try it, but I was looking for a way down to the basement where the noise was coming from. I closed the door and tried the second room off the hallway. This revealed a doorway to the basement. I descended the stairs, calling out, Hello, loudly. No reply. The door was ajar at the bottom, and there was nothing for it but to walk in. Immediately there was a dead silence, and I was conscious of about a dozen pairs of eyes looking at me. Most of them were the wide, innocent eyes of children, but amidst them were the coal-black eyes of a handsome woman with black hair hanging in heavy waves past her shoulders. Her skin was beautiful, pale but slightly tawny. Her shapely arms were wet from the washing tub, and soap clung to her fingers. Although obviously engaged in the endless household chore of washing, she did not look slovenly. Her figure was large, but not over-large. Her breasts were well supported, her hips were large but not flabby. 
Her flowered apron covered her plain dress, and the crimson band which held back the dark hair accentuated the exquisite contrast between skin and hair. She was tall, and the poise of her shapely head on a slender neck spoke eloquently of the proud beauty of a Spanish contessa with generations of aristocracy behind her. She did not say a word. I felt uncomfortable and started babbling on about being the district midwife and getting no reply when I knocked and wanting to see the rooms for a home confinement. She did not reply, so I repeated myself. Still no reply. She just gazed at me with calm composure. I began to wonder if she was deaf. Then two or three of the children began talking to her in rapid Spanish. An exquisite smile spread across her face. She stepped towards me and said, Si, baby. I asked if I might look at the bedroom. No reply. I looked towards one of the children who had spoken, a girl of about fifteen. She spoke to her mother in Spanish, who said with gracious courtesy and a slight inclination of her sculptured head, Si. It was clear that Mrs. Conchita Warren spoke no English. The impression this woman made upon me was extraordinary. Even in the 1950s, that basement would have been described as squalid. It contained a stone sink, washing, a boiler bubbling away, a mangle, clothes and nappies hanging all over the place, a large table covered with pots and plates and bits of food, a gas stove covered with dirty saucepans and frying pans, and a mixture of unpleasant smells. Yet this proud and beautiful woman was completely in control and commanded respect. The girl showed me upstairs to the first floor. The front bedroom was perfectly adequate. There was a large double bed, three cots, two wooden drop-sided cots, a small crib, two very large chests of drawers, and a small wardrobe. The lighting was electric. The floor covering was lino. The girl said, Mum's got it all ready, and pulled open a drawer full of snowy white baby clothes. I asked to see the lavatory. There was more than that. There was a bathroom. Excellent. We descended to the kitchen. I thanked Mrs. Warren and said everything was most satisfactory. She smiled. Her daughter spoke to her, and she said, See? Si. I needed to take an obstetric history, but I did not feel I could ask one of the children to interpret. I asked my little guide when her father would be home, and she told me, in the evening. I asked her to tell her mother I would be back after six o'clock. I had several other visits that morning, but my mind continually drifted back to Mrs. Warren. She was so unusual. Most of our patients were Londoners who had been born in the area and lived a communal life endlessly engaged in each other's business. But if Mrs. Warren spoke no English, she could not be part of that sorority. Another thing that intrigued me was her quiet dignity. Most of the women I met in the East End were a bit raucous. Also, there was her Latin beauty. I wanted to find out more about her. End of Disc 2 Call the Midwife, Disc 3 Lunch at Nonata's house was the main meal of the day and a communal meal for the sisters and lay staff alike. I always looked forward to it because I was always hungry. Twelve to fifteen of us sat down each day at the table. After Grace, I introduced the subject of Mrs. Conchita Warren. She was well known by the sisters, although not a lot of contact had been made because of her lack of English. Apparently she had lived in the East End most of her life. How was it, then, that she didn't speak the language? The sisters did not know. It was suggested that perhaps she had no inclination to learn the language, or perhaps she just wasn't very bright. How did she come to be in London at all? I asked. Apparently Mr. Warren was born into the life of the docks and destined for the work of his father and uncles, but something had made him rebel, and he went off to fight in the Spanish Civil War. He came home with a beautiful Spanish peasant girl of about eleven or twelve. He returned to his mother's house with the girl, and they lived together. What his relatives or neighbours thought of this shocking occurrence can only be conjectured, but his mother stuck by him, and he was not one to be intimidated by a pack of gossiping neighbours. 
Anyway, they could hardly send the girl back, because he had forgotten where she came from, and she didn't seem to know. Quite apart from this, he loved her. When it was possible, he married her. This was not easy, because she had no birth certificate and was not sure of her surname, date of birth, or parentage. However, as she had had three or four babies by then, and looked about sixteen, and as she was presumably Roman Catholic, a local priest was persuaded to solemnize the already fecund relationship. I was fascinated. This was the stuff of high romance. A peasant girl? She certainly didn't look like a peasant. She looked like a princess of the Spanish court whom the Republicans had dispossessed. Had the brave Englishman rescued her and carried her off? What a story! Everything about it was unusual, and I looked forward to meeting Mr. Warren that evening. Then I remembered the children. I said to Sister Julienne saucily, I've caught you out in a mistake at last. You put in the day book the twenty-fourth pregnancy, when you must have meant the fourteenth. Sister Julienne's eyes twinkled. Oh, no, she said, that was no mistake. Conchita Warren really has had twenty-three babies and is expecting her twenty-fourth. I was stunned. The whole story was so preposterous that no one could possibly have made it up. The door was open when I returned to their home, so I stepped in. The house was literally teeming with young people and children. I had seen only very young children and a girl in the morning. Now all the school children were home, as well as several older teenagers who had presumably returned from work. It seemed like a party. They all looked so happy. Older children were carrying tiny ones around. Some were playing in the street. Some were doing what might have been homework. There was absolutely no discord. And in all the contact I had with this family, no fighting or nasty temper was ever in evidence. I squeezed past the ladder and the prams, and was directed down to the basement kitchen. Len Warren was sitting on a chair by the table, comfortably smoking a roll-up. A baby was on his knee. Another crawled along the table, and he had to keep pulling him back by his pants to prevent him falling off. A couple of toddlers sat on his foot, and he was jigging them up and down, singing, Oh, see, oh, see, don't you stop. They were screaming with laughter, and so was the father. Laughter lines creased his eyes and nose. He was older than his wife, about fifty-ish, not at all good-looking in the conventional sense, but so frank and open, so downright pleasant-looking, that it did your heart good to see him. We grinned at each other, and I told him I wanted to examine his wife and take some notes. That's okay. Con's doing the supper, but I expect she can leave it to win. Conchita was calm and radiant, standing by the boiler, which in the morning had been doing the washing and was now cooking an enormous quantity of pasta. Copper boilers were common in those days. They were tubs, large enough to contain about twenty gallons, standing on legs with a gas jet underneath. A tap at the front was the means of emptying them. They were intended for washing, and this was the first time I had seen one used for cooking, but I surmised that this would be the only way of catering for such a huge family. Here, Wynne, you take over the supper, will you, love? Nurse wants to look at your mum. Tim, come here, lad. You take the baby and keep them two away from the boiler. We don't want no accidents in this house, do we now? And Doris, love, you lend hand to our win. I'll take your mum and the nurse upstairs. The girls spoke rapidly to their mother in Spanish, and Conchita came towards me smiling. We went upstairs, Len chatting all the time to different children. Now then, Cyril, now then, let's get that lorry off them stairs, shall we? There's a good lad. We don't want the nurse to break our neck, do we now? Good on you, Pete, doing your own work. He's a scholar, our Pete. He'll be a professor one of these days, you'll see. Hello, Sue, my love. Got a kiss for your old dad, then? He very seldom stopped talking. In fact, I would say that in all my acquaintance with Len Warren, he never stopped talking. If occasionally he ran out of something to say, he would whistle or sing, and all executed with a thin roll-up in his mouth. We went into the bedroom. Connie, love, the nurse just wants to have a look at your tum. He smoothed down the bed, and she lay down. He started to pull up her skirt, and she did the rest. Her abdomen showed stretch marks, but nothing excessive. 
From appearances, this could have been her fourth pregnancy, not her twenty-fourth. I palpated the uterus. About five to six months. Any movements? I inquired. Oh, yeah. You can feel the little soul kicking and wriggling. He's a right little footballer, that one, especially at night when we wants to get some sleep. The head felt uppermost, but that was to be expected. I couldn't locate the fetal heart, but with all the kicking described, it hardly mattered. I examined the rest of her. Her breasts were full but firm, no lumps or abnormalities. Her ankles were not swollen. There were a few superficial varicose veins, but nothing serious. The pulse was normal, as was her blood pressure. She seemed to be in perfect condition. I wanted to try to establish her dates. Merely going on clinical observation can be deceptive. A small baby and a large baby of the same gestation can give the appearance of about four to six weeks' difference, so you need some dates to back up observation. However, with a baby of about seven to eight months old downstairs, it seemed unlikely that Conchita had had a period at all. I was not accustomed to asking such delicate questions of a man. In the 1950s, such things were never mentioned in what was called mixed company, and I felt myself blush scarlet. Oh, no, nah, nothing like that, he said. Could you ask her, please? She might not have mentioned it to you. You can take it from me, nurse. She an had no periods for years. I had to leave it at that. If anyone knows, he should, I thought. I mentioned that we had an antenatal clinic every Tuesday, and we preferred patients to come to the clinic. He looked dubious. Well, she didn't like going out, you know, not speaking the lingo and all like, and I wouldn't want her to get lost or frightened like. Besides, she's got all them babies to look after at home, you know. I didn't feel I could insist, so I put her down for home antenatal visits. In all this time, Conchita hadn't said a word. She just smiled and submitted passively to being felt and prodded all over, to hearing herself talked about in a foreign language. She got up from the bed with grace and dignity and moved to the chest of drawers searching for a hairbrush. Her black hair looked even more beautiful being brushed, and I observed hardly a grey hair. She adjusted the crimson band and turned with proud confidence to her husband, who took her in his arms and murmured, There's my com, my girl. Oh, you looks lovely, my treasure. She gave a contented little laugh and nestled in his arms. He kissed her repeatedly. Such a display of unashamed love between husband and wife was unusual in Poplar. Whatever the relationship in private, the men always kept up a show of rough indifference in front of other people. A good deal of lewd banter often went on between them, which I found very amusing, but they did not openly speak of love. I found the tender, gentle and adoring looks of Len and Conchita Warren very affecting. I returned many times to the house over the next four months, checking Conchita's progress. I always went in the evenings in order to speak with Len about the pregnancy. Anyway, I liked his company, liked listening to him talk, and enjoyed the atmosphere of this happy family. Len was a painter and decorator. He must have been a good one because 90% of his jobs were up west. All the knobs houses was how he described his work. Three or four of his elder sons worked with their father in the business, and apparently he was never short of work. With low running costs, there must have been quite a bit of money coming into the household. Len worked from home, from his shed in the backyard, where he also kept his barrow. Workmen in those days didn't have vans. They had barrows, usually made of wood and often homemade. Len's was made out of the chassis of an old pram, with an elongated wooden construction fitted to the highly sprung base. It was perfect. The springs made for lightness of movement, and the huge, well-oiled wheels made it easy to push. When going out to a new job, Len and his sons would load up the barrow and push it to the address. They may have had to push for ten miles or more, but that was all part of the job. In that respect, a painter and decorator was lucky, because a job usually lasted a week or so, and they could leave their stuff at the house and go home by tube as far as Aldgate. Plumbers, plasterers and such like were less fortunate. Their jobs usually only lasted a day, so they had to push the tools to the job and then push them home in the evening. In those days, you would see workmen laboriously pushing their barrows all over London, which held up the traffic considerably. 
but drivers were used to it and just accepted it as part of the London scene. Len and Conchita's children were beautiful. Many of them had raven black hair and huge black eyes like their mother. The older girls were stunners and could easily have been models. They all talked in a curious mixture of Cockney and Spanish when together. With their mother, they spoke only Spanish. With their father, or any other English person, pure Cockney. I was very impressed by this bilingual facility. I wasn't able to get to know any of them very well, principally because their father never stopped talking. The only girl I did have contact with was Lizzie, who was about twenty and a very skilled dressmaker. I have always loved clothes and became a regular client of hers. In the last month of Conchita's pregnancy, I visited weekly. One evening, Len suggested I had a bit of supper with them. I was delighted. It smelled good, and as usual, I was hungry. I was not at all squeamish about eating food cooked in the boiler that had been used in the morning for washing the baby's nappies, so I accepted with pleasure. Len said, I reckon as how the nurse would like a plate like. You get a one, will you, Liz, love? Liz piled some pasta onto a plate for me and gave me a fork. It was only then that Conchita revealed her peasant origins. All the rest of the family ate from the same dish. Two large, shallow bowls were filled with pasta and placed on the table. Each member of the family had a fork and ate from the communal bowl. I alone had a separate plate. I had seen this once before when I was living in Paris and had spent a weekend with an Italian peasant family who had moved to the Paris area to find work. The time came for Conchita's confinement. There were no dates to go by and therefore no certainty when she was due, but the baby's head was well down and she looked near the end of term. I'll be glad when we gets this baby out. She's getting tired. I won't go to work no more. The lads can do the job. I'll stop here and look after Con and the kids. This he did, to my amazement. In those days, no self-respecting East Ender would demean himself by doing what he would call women work. Most men would not lift a dirty plate or mug from the table, but Len did everything. Conchita lay in bed late in the mornings, or sat in a comfortable chair in the kitchen. Sometimes she played with the little ones, but Len was always watching, and if they got too boisterous, he firmly took them away and amused them elsewhere. Sally, the girl of fifteen, who had left school, but not yet gone out to work, was there to help him. Nonetheless, Len could do everything. Change nappies, feed toddlers, clear up messes, shopping, cooking, and the endless washing and ironing. And all this was accompanied by singing or whistling and unfailing good humour. Incidentally, he was the only man I have ever met who could roll a fag with one hand and feed a baby with the other. Conchita's twenty-fourth baby was born at night. A phone call came through at about 11pm that the waters had broken. As fast as I could, I pedalled along to Limehouse because I guessed it would be a quick labour. I was not wrong. I found everything in perfect readiness. Conchita was lying on clean sheets with the brown paper and a rubber sheet under her, the room was warm, the baby's crib and baby clothes were all waiting. Hot water was boiling in the kitchen. Len was sitting beside her, massaging her stomach, her thighs, her back and her breasts. He had a cold flannel with which to wipe her face and neck, and with every contraction he took her in his arms and held her tight. He murmured encouraging noises. There's my girl, there's my lass, won't be long now. I've got you, just hold on to me. I was startled to see him there. I had expected to see his mother or an elder daughter. I had never seen a man at a delivery before apart from a doctor. But in this, as in everything else, Len was exceptional. A glance told me Conchita was very near the second stage. I gowned up quickly and laid out my tray. The fetal heart was steady and the head barely palpable. It must have been already down on the pelvic floor. As the waters had broken, I did not do a vaginal examination because any such intrusion could risk infection and unless absolutely essential should be avoided. The contractions were coming about every three minutes. Conchita was sweating and moaning slightly. 
She smiled at her husband between each contraction and relaxed completely in his arms. She had had no sedation. We did not have long to wait. A change came over her facial expression, that of intense concentration. She gave a grunt of effort, and with the next push, the whole baby slid out at once. It was a small baby, and delivery was so quick I had no time to do anything more than catch the child. I cleared the airway, and Len handed me the cord clamps and the scissors. He knew exactly what to do. The placenta came out fairly quickly also, and there was no excessive bleeding. Len wrapped the baby tenderly in warm towels and placed her in the crib. He called downstairs for hot water and gave the message that a little girl had been born. Then he washed his wife and deftly changed the sheets. He brushed her black hair and put a white hairband on her to match her white nighty. He called her his pet, his love, his treasure. She smiled dreamily at him. He called downstairs for one of his children. Here, Liz, you take these bloody sheets and put them in the boiler, will you, love? We might think about a nice cup of tea, eh? Then he turned back to his wife, took the baby from the cradle and handed it to her. She smiled contentedly, touching the baby's little head and kissing its wee face. She didn't say anything, just chuckled with contentment. Len was ecstatic and started talking non-stop again. During Conchita's labour he had hardly said a thing. It was the only time I had ever known him to be silent, but now nothing could stop him. Ah, oh, look at her. Just look at her, nurse. Isn't she beautiful? Look at her little hands. See, she's got fingernails. Ah, oh, she's opening her little mouth. Oh, you little sweet, aren't you? See, she's got long eyelashes like her mum. She's just perfect. He was as excited as a young father with his first baby. He called all the other children up, and they all sat round their mother, talking in a mixture of Spanish and English. Only the toddlers were asleep. The rest of the house was awake and excited. I packed up my equipment and slipped out of the room, feeling that the unity and happiness of the family would be all the greater if I was not there. Len saw me leave and courteously came out with me. As we left, I noticed that the conversation behind us slipped into Spanish. He thanked me for all I had done, although I had done virtually nothing. As he carried my bag downstairs, he said, Let's have a nice cup of tea together, shall us, nurse? He chatted happily all the time we had our tea. I told him how much I liked and admired his family. He was a proud father. I told him how impressed I was that they all spoke Spanish so fluently. Oh, they're a clever lot, my kids, they are. Cleverer than their old dad. I never could pick up the lingo myself. Quite suddenly, with blinding insight, the secret of their blissful marriage was revealed to me. She couldn't speak a word of English, and he couldn't speak a word of Spanish. Due to a broken shoulder, I was unable to take the final midwifery exam and had to wait several months for the next sitting. Sister Julienne suggested I might join the general district practice for added experience. Whilst I was eager to undertake the nursing, I was not keen to work with Sister Evangelina, who was in charge of general district nursing. I found her ponderous and humourless, and she did not at all approve of me. She was constantly finding fault. Untidiness, daydreaming, wool-gathering, she called it. Boisterousness, singing in the clinical room, forgetfulness, the list was endless. I could do nothing right for Sister Evangelina. We worked together for several months, and whilst I never grew close to her, I certainly grew to understand her better, and to realise that all nuns, by the very fact of their monastic profession, are exceptional people. No ordinary woman could live such a life. There must inevitably be something, or many things, that are outstanding about a nun. To me, Sister Evangelina looked about forty-five, an unimaginable age when you were twenty-three. But nuns always look years younger than they really are, and she had, in fact, been a nurse in the First World War, so must have been over sixty. 
The first morning did not start well, with Sister Evangelina commenting on my dawdling and wool-gathering as usual, and didn't I realize we had twenty-three insulin injections, four sterile dressings, two leg ulcers, and three post-operative hernias, as well as two catheterizations, two bed baths, and three enemas to get through before lunch. All the midwives had gone, and we were the last to leave that morning. The bicycle shed was nearly empty. Sister Evangelina's favourite bicycle had been taken inadvertently by someone else. Her nose grew red, her eyes bulged, and she muttered under her breath about how she didn't like this one, and that old triumph was too small and the sunbeam was too high, and she supposed she would have to make do with the rally. Respectfully, I pulled the rally out for her, fixed the black bag on the back, and watched the tyres sag as her large, heavy body clambered onto it. I think I realised then that she was not in her forties. Her square, bulky frame had no agility, and it was only by sheer determination and willpower that she got herself pedalling at all. Once out on the road, her mood seemed to lighten, and she turned to me with something that resembled a smile. Along the street, numerous voices called out, "'Morning, Sister Evie!' She smiled brightly. I hadn't seen her smile like that before and called gaily back. In the houses she was bluff and gruff, and not at all polite. Now then, Mr. Thomas, have you got your sample ready? Don't keep me waiting, I've got to test it, and I haven't got all day to hang around waiting for you. Right, hold still for the injection. Hold still, I said. Now, I'm off. If you start eating sweets, they'll kill you. Not that I would care, and I dare say your missus would be glad to see the back of you, but the dog would miss you. I was shocked. This was no way to talk to patients, according to the nursing textbooks. But the old man and his missus roared with laughter, and he said, If I goes first, I'll keep a place warm for you, eh, Sister Evie? And we can share the toasting fork. I thought she would be furious at such effrontery, but she stomped downstairs in good humour with, Out of my way, boy, to a child we met in the passage. Her good humour and her rough badinage with all the patients continued throughout the morning. I ceased to be startled, because I realised that this was what the patients liked about her. She approached them all without a trace of sentimentality or condescension. The older Docklanders were accustomed to middle-class do-gooders, who deigned to act graciously to inferiors. But Sister Evangelina had no patronising airs and graces. She was incapable of them. She was unswervingly honest, and reacted to every person and every situation without guile or affectation. As the months passed, I began to understand why Sister Evangelina was so popular. It was because she was one of them. She was not a cockney, but had been born into a very poor working-class family from Reading. She never told me this, she hardly ever spoke to me, but from remarks made to the patients it became perfectly clear. For example, These young housewives don't know they're born. What? A lavatory in every flat? Remember the old middens, do you, Dad, and the newspaper on the seat and queuing up in the frost when you're bursting? This was usually followed by laughter and some coarse lavatorial humour, ending up with the old chestnut about the chap who fell in a midden and came up with a gold watch. Lavatory humour was not considered vulgar or in bad taste because the natural bodily functions were a conspicuous event. There was no privacy. A dozen or more families shared one midden, which had only half a door the upper and lower portions being missing, so everyone knew who was in it, could hear everything, and above all, could smell everything. She's a stinker was not a moral observation, but a statement of fact. Sister Evangelina shared this robust humour. Before an enema. Now then, Dad, we're going to put a squib up your ass. Shake your insides about a bit. Caught the jerry ready, Mother, and the clothes begs to clip on our noses. Laughter would continue about how he hadn't been for a fortnight, and there must be a turd inside as big as an elephant's, and no one was the slightest bit embarrassed, least of all the patient. No, indeed. Sister Evangelina was not humourless. The only trouble was that at Nonata's house her humour was different from everyone else's. She was surrounded by middle-class values, and the safety valve of humour, which was common to all the nuns, was perpetually closed to her. She simply couldn't understand their jokes, so she appeared solemn and heavily serious. 
It was only with her patients in the Docklands that she could truly be herself. She shared the older people's fear of hospitals, a fear which was widely expressed through scorn and derision. Most hospitals in England, even in the 1950s, were converted workhouses, so the buildings alone had an aura of degradation and death for people who had lived all their lives with the terror of being sent to the workhouse. Sister Evangelina did nothing to dispel this fear of hospitals. She would say things like, You don't want to go into hospital to be messed about by a lot of students, or They only make out they treat the poor for the benefit of the rich, both statements implying that the hospital liked to experiment on their poor patients. She proclaimed, from experience, that women who went into hospital with complications after a backstreet abortion were deliberately given a rough time. That Sister Evangelina was unswervingly honest spoke to the truth of her statement. Whether such treatment was widespread in England in the early part of this century, I am unable to say. However, in the mid-1950s, I witnessed the appalling truth of her remark in a Paris hospital, an experience I had been unable to forget. Sister Evangelina had plenty of homespun advice to offer her patients. Wherever you be, let your wind go free, to which the reply was always chanted, In church and chapel, let it rattle. Once an old man followed this by, Oops, sorry, sister, no disrespect, and she replied, None taken, I'm sure the rector does it and all. Constipation, diarrhoea, leaks and greens, gripes and pipes, flutes and fluffs provided more hilarity than any other subject, and Sister Evangelina was always in the thick of it. After recovering from my initial shock, I realized that it was not considered to be vulgar or obscene. If the King of France had been able to defecate daily before his entire court, so could the Cockneys. On the other hand, Sexual obscenities and blasphemy were strictly taboo in respectable poplar families, and sexual morality was expected and enforced. But I digress. Sister Evangelina interested me greatly because of her background. The slums of Reading in the 19th century, and the fact that she had raised herself from abject poverty and semi-literacy to become a trained nurse and midwife. It would have been hard enough for a young man but for a girl to break free from ignorance and poverty and become accepted in a middle-class profession was exceptional. Only a very strong character could have achieved it. I discovered that the First World War had been her key to freedom. She was sixteen when war broke out and had been working in the Huntley and Palmer's Biscuit Factory in Reading since the age of eleven. In 1914, posters appeared all over the town calling on people to join the war effort. She hated Huntley and Palmer's, and with youthful optimism decided that a munitions factory could only be an improvement. She had to leave home as the factory was seven miles away, too far to walk when working hours were from 6am to 8pm. Accommodation was provided for the girls and women in dormitories that slept 70 females on narrow iron bedsteads with horsehair mattresses. The young Evie had never slept in a bed by herself before, and thought this really must be an example of superior living. A uniform and shoes were provided for the workers, and as she had only worn rags and no shoes before, this was also a real luxury. Food from the factory kitchens, though plain, was better than anything she had ever had. At the factory bench, where she stood all day putting nuts into military machinery, a girl talked about her sister, who was a nurse, and told stories about the young men who were wounded and dying. Something stirred in Evie's soul, and she knew she must become a nurse. She found out where the girl's sister worked and applied to the matron. She was only sixteen, but was accepted as a VAD, which really meant, for a girl of her class, a skivvy in the hospital wards. She didn't mind. It was the sort of menial work she had been doing all her life, with no promise of anything else. But this time, the horizons were broader and clearer. She watched the trained nurses with admiration, and decided that however long it took, she would be one of them. Sister Evangelina and her ageing poplar patients spoke frequently about the First World War, and shared memories and experiences. It was from these conversations overheard during a bed bath or a surgical dressing that I was able to piece together her history. 
She spoke only once about her soldier patients. She said, They were so young, so very young. A whole generation of young men died, leaving a whole generation of young women to weep. I looked across the bed at her and saw tears gathering in her eyes. She sniffed loudly and stamped her foot, then continued bandaging up the dressing somewhat roughly with, There you are, Dad. That's it. We'll see you in three days. Keep them open, and stomped off. Mrs. Jenkins was never welcome, never wanted, and often feared. For years she had been tramping all over the Docklands in her obsession with newborn babies. She always seemed to know when and where a home confinement would take place, and nine times out of ten, at any time of the day or night, often in atrocious weather, would be found in the street outside the house. Her inquiries about, Alf's a baby, Alf's a little one, were invariably the same. On being told the baby was alive and healthy, she seemed satisfied and shuffled away. She was a tiny woman, as thin as a rake, with bird-like features and a long pointed nose between hollow sunken cheeks. Her skin was a yellowish-grey, crisscrossed with a thousand wrinkles, and she appeared to have no lips because they were drawn in over her toothless gums, and she chewed and sucked them all the time. A faded black hat, greasy and shapeless, was pulled down low over her head, from which tufts of wispy grey hair escaped. Summer and winter, she wore the same long grey coat of indeterminate age, from beneath which protruded enormous feet. Where she lived, no one knew. The clergy had no idea. She didn't go to church, which was unusual among older women. The doctors did not know, as she did not seem to be registered. Perhaps she did not know there was now a national health service and medical treatment was free of charge. My contact with her was frequent, but always confined to her questions about the baby and my cold reply. Mother and baby are well, to which she invariably replied, Thank God, thank God for that. I had always found her repugnant. On one occasion, while I was on my rounds, I saw her step off the pavement into the road. She stood, with legs wide apart, and peed into the gutter like a horse. There were a lot of people around at the time, and none of them looked surprised as a torrent of urine streamed into the gutter and down the drain. Once I saw her in a little alley between two buildings. She picked up a piece of newspaper, then lifted her coat, and started rubbing the newspaper round her private parts, intent on her task, grunting the while. Then she let the coat fall and started examining the contents of the newspaper, poking it with her fingernails, sniffing it, peering at it closely. Finally she folded it up and put it in her pocket. I shuddered with revulsion. Another unpleasant thing about Mrs. Jenkins was a brown stain on her face that extended from her nose to her upper lip and was ingrained in the lines at the corners of her mouth. Having seen her lavatorial habits, it is not hard to imagine what I assumed this brown stain to be. But I was wrong. As I got to know her better, I discovered that Mrs. Jenkins took snuff, her comfort, as she called it, and the brown stain was caused by the snuff dropping out of her nose. I had always been repelled by Mrs. Jenkins and didn't want to get involved. But once, when I was with Sister Julienne, she went straight up to the woman, took both her hands in her own, and with her all-embracing smile said, Hello, Mrs. Jenkins. How nice to see you. What a lovely day it is. How are you getting on? Mrs. Jenkins shrank back, a half-afraid, half-suspicious look in her dull grey eyes, and pulled her hands away. How's the baby? she said. Her voice was rasping. The baby's lovely. A beautiful little girl, strong and healthy. Do you like babies, Mrs. Jenkins? Mrs. Jenkins shrank away still further and pulled the collar of her coat up over her chin. A baby girl, you say, doing nicely. Thank God. Yes, thank God indeed. Would you like to see her? I'm sure I could get the mother's permission and bring the baby out for a few moments. But Mrs. Jenkins had already turned and was hobbling away in her large man-sized boots. An expression of infinite love and compassion spread over Sister Julienne's face. She stood quite still for several minutes, watching the bent old figure shuffling along the pavement. I watched Mrs. Jenkins, too, and noticed that she shuffled 
because she hadn't the strength to lift the boots off the ground. Then I looked again at Sister Julienne and felt ashamed. Sister wasn't looking at the boots. She was looking, I felt, at seventy years of pain, suffering and endurance, and holding Mrs. Jenkins before God in her silent prayers. The sisters received a request from a locum doctor in Limehouse to visit a house in the Cable Street area of Stepney. This was a notorious prostitute's area. The doctor reported that an elderly lady with mild angina was living in appalling conditions and probably suffering from malnutrition. The patient's name was Mrs. Jenkins. I turned off Commercial Road, heading towards the river, and found the street. Only half a dozen buildings remained. The rest were bomb sites, with a jagged wall sticking up here and there. I found the door and knocked. Silence. I turned the door handle, but it was locked. I went round the side, which was littered with filth, but a thick layer of dirt covered the windows and I could not see through. A cat rolled sensuously on its back, whilst another sniffed at a pile of garbage. I returned to the front door and knocked louder. A window opened in a house opposite, and a female voice called, What you want? I'm the district nurse, and I've come to see Mrs. Jenkins. Throw a stone up at the second floor window, was the advice. I felt a perfect fool standing in nurse's uniform with my black bag at my feet throwing stones. How on earth did the doctor get in, I wondered. Eventually, the window opened, and a man's voice called out in a thick foreign accent. You see, old woman, I come. Bolts were pulled back, and the man stood well behind the door as it opened so I could not see him. He pointed along the passage to a door at the end, saying, She live there. Victorian tiles flagged the passageway, which passed a staircase with a fine carved oak banister. This was still in beautiful condition, although the stairs were crumbling and looked highly dangerous. The house had obviously been part of a fine old Regency terrace once, but was now in the last stages of decay. It had been classed as unfit for human habitation twenty years previously, yet people were still living there, hidden away amongst the rats. No sound came when I rapped on the door, so I walked in. The room had been the back scullery and wash house, a single-storey extension with a stone-flagged floor. A large copper boiler was attached to an outside wall, and next to it was a coke stove with an asbestos flue running up the wall and out of the ceiling through a huge and jagged hole open to the sky. A large iron mangle and a stone sink were the only other objects that caught my eye. The room appeared empty and abandoned and smelled powerfully of cats and urine. It was very dark because the windows were so black with dirt that no light could penetrate. In fact, most of the light came from the hole in the roof. As my eyes became accustomed to the gloom, I discerned a few other things. Several saucers lying around the floor with bits of food and milk in them. A small wooden chair and table with a tin mug and teapot on it. A chamber pot. A wooden cupboard with no door. There was no bed. No sign of gas or electricity. In the corner furthest from the hole in the ceiling was a decrepit-looking armchair in which an old woman sat, silent, watchful, her eyes filled with fear. She shrank back in the chair, her old coat pulled tight round her, a woolen scarf over her head and covering her face. Only her eyes showed as our gaze met. Mrs. Jenkins... The doctor tells us you are not well and need home nursing. I am the district nurse. Can I have a look at you, please? She pulled her coat closer round her chin and stared at me silently. Doctor says your heart's fluttering a bit. Can I feel your pulse, please? I put my hand out to her wrist, but she pulled the arm away with a terrified intake of breath. I was nonplussed and felt a bit helpless. I didn't want to frighten her but I had a job to do. I went over to read the notes by the light coming through the ceiling. There had been evidence of a mild attack of angina pectoris when the patient had fallen in the street outside the house, and an unnamed resident had carried her back to her room. 
The same man had called a doctor and admitted him. The woman had obviously been in pain, but this seemed to pass fairly quickly. The doctor had been unable to examine the patient due to her violent resistance, but as her pulse was fairly steady and her breathing had improved rapidly, the doctor had advised a nursing visit twice a day to monitor the situation and suggested that the social services department might improve the woman's living conditions. Amyl nitrate had been prescribed in the event of another attack. Rest, warmth and good food were advised. I tried again to feel Mrs. Jenkins' pulse, with the same result. I inquired if she'd had any more pain, and got no reply. I asked if she was comfortable, and again there was no reply. I was getting nowhere. I was not too keen on reporting my total failure to Sister Evangelina, because she still seemed to think me a bit of a fool. She called me Dolly Daydream, and spoke to me as though I needed to be directed in the most rudimentary points of nursing procedure. Her reaction was predictable. She listened to my report in heavy silence, glancing up at me from under thick grey eyebrows. When I'd finished, she sighed noisily, as though I were the biggest fool ever to carry the black bag. This evening I have twenty-one insulin injections, four penicillin, an ear to syringe, bunions to dress, piles to compress, a cannula to drain, and now I suppose I have to show you how to take a pulse. I was stung by the injustice. I know perfectly well how to take a pulse, but the patient wouldn't let me and I couldn't persuade her. Couldn't persuade her? Couldn't persuade her? You young girls can't do anything. Too much bookwork, that's your trouble. Sitting in classrooms all day, filling your heads with codswallop, then you can't do a simple thing like taking a pulse. She gave a contemptuous snort. Well then, miss can't take a pulse. I suppose I will have to go with you. We reached the house without a word, and knocked. Again, no reply. I told Sister about the man on the second floor. Well, get hold of him then, don't stand around talking, chatterbox. I ground my teeth and started throwing stones at the window in a fury. It was surprising I didn't break the glass. The man shouted out, I come, and hid behind the door again as we passed. In the dim light of Mrs. Jenkins' room, a cat came towards us, mewing. The wind made a curious sound as it hit the hole in the roof. Mrs. Jenkins was huddled in her chair just as I had left her. Sister Evangelina called her name. No reply. I was beginning to feel justified. She would see that I had not been exaggerating. Sister walked over to the armchair. She spoke gently. Come on, mother. This won't do. Doctor says there's something up with your ticker. Don't you believe a word of it. Your heart is as good as mine, but we've got to have a look at you. No one's going to hurt you. The bundle of clothes in the chair didn't move. Sister leaned forward to feel her pulse. The arm was pulled away. I was delighted. Let's see how Sister Know-All copes, I thought. It's cold in here. Haven't you got a fire? No reply. It's dark, too. What about a light for us? No reply. When did you first feel bad? Again, total silence. I was feeling very smug. Sister Evangelina appeared as incapable of examining the patient as I had. What would happen next? What, in fact, did happen next was so utterly unexpected that to this day, more than fifty years later, I blush to remember it. Sister Evangelina muttered, You're a tiresome old lady. We'll see what this does. Slowly, she leaned over Mrs. Jenkins and let out the most enormous fart. It rumbled on and on, and just as I thought it had stopped, it started all over again in a higher key. I had never been so shocked in all my life. Mrs. Jenkins sat upright in her chair. Sister Evangelina called out, Which way did it go, nurse? Don't let it get out. It's over there by the door. Catch it. Now it's by the window. Get hold of it. Quick. A throaty chuckle came from the armchair. Gah, that's better, said Sister Evangelina happily. Nothing like a good fart to clear the system makes you feel ten years younger, eh, Mother Jenkins? The bundle of clothes shook, and the throaty chuckle developed into a real belly laugh. Mrs. Jenkins laughed until the tears ran down her face. Quick, under the chair, 
The cat's got it. Get it off him quick, he'll be sick. Sister Evangelina sat down beside her, and the two old ladies rocked with laughter about farts and bums and turds and stinks, swapping stories true or false I couldn't tell. I was deeply shocked. I retreated to a corner and watched them. They looked like two old hags from a Bruegel painting, sharing lewd laughter with the happiness of children. I was completely out of the joke, and had time to ponder many things not least of which was how on earth Sister Evangelina had been able to produce such a spectacular fart at that precise moment. Could she command one at will? Was Sister Evangelina gifted, or had she acquired the skill through hours of practice? My mind dwelled with pleasure on the possibility. Was it her party piece? I wondered how it would go down at the convent on festive occasions. Would the Reverend Mother and her sisters in Christ be amused by such a singular talent? The two old girls were so innocently happy that my initial reaction of disapproval seemed to be churlish and mean-spirited. What was wrong with it, anyway? All children laugh endlessly about bottoms and farts. The works of Chaucer, Rabelais, and Fielding are full of lavatorial humour. There was no doubt about it. Sister Evangelina's action had been brilliant, a masterstroke. To say that a fart cleared the air may seem a contradiction in terms, but life is full of contradictions. From that moment on, Mrs. Jenkins lost her fear of us. We were able to examine her, to treat her, to communicate with her. And I was able to learn her tragic history. Rosie? That you, Rosie? The old lady lifted her head and called out as the front door banged. Footsteps were heard in the passage, but Rosie did not enter the room. Things were happening fast to improve Mrs. Jenkins' living conditions. The social services had been called and some cleaning had been carried out. The old armchair had been removed because it was full of fleas, and another donated. A bed had also been provided, but had never been slept in. Mrs. Jenkins was so accustomed to sleeping in an armchair, she could not be persuaded to try the bed, so the cat slept on it. Sister Evangelina commented wryly that the new government must have more money than sense to provide social services for cats. The most remarkable change was the repair of the hole in the roof, which Sister Evangelina achieved through single-handed combat with the landlord. She put the fear of God into him. The result was a heavy tarpaulin weighted down with bricks. Mrs. Jenkins was delighted and grinned and giggled with Sister Evie as they shared a cup of tea and a piece of Mrs. B's homemade cake that Sister Evie invariably brought with her. A tarpaulin to mend a hole in the roof may seem inadequate, but there was no chance of getting anything more durable. The building was condemned. The fact that it was still lived in was due to the acute housing shortage caused by the bombing of London in the war. People were glad to live anywhere they could find. The coke stove was usable, but furred up, and Fred, boiler man of Nonata's house, cleaned and serviced it. Sister Evangelina was determined that Mrs. Jenkins should stay in her own home. If the social services had their way, they would put her in an old people's home tomorrow, and not having that, it would kill her. When we first examined Mrs. Jenkins, we found her heart to be quite fair. Angina is common amongst the elderly, and with a quiet life, warmth and rest, it can be kept under control. Her main problems were chronic malnutrition and her mental state. She was clearly a very strange old lady, but was she mad? We could not tell without assessing her over a period of weeks. The other problems were dirt, fleas and lice. It was my job to clean her up. A tin bath was brought from Nonata's house, and I boiled up water on the coke stove. Mrs. Jenkins was dubious about all this, but I only had to mention that Sister Evangelina wanted her to have a bath, and she relaxed and chuckled. She's a good and she is. I tells my Rosie and all. We as a good laugh, we as, Rose and me. I had quite a job persuading her to undress, and she was very apprehensive. Under the old coat, she wore a rough wool skirt and jumper, but no vest or knickers. Her frail little body was pathetic to behold. There was no flesh on her, and all her bones stuck out at sharp angles. I could count every rib. 
The revulsion she had hitherto inspired in me turned to pity when I beheld her frail skeletal body. Pity is one thing, shock another. Shock was waiting for me when I took her boots off. I had noticed her huge man-sized boots before and wondered why she wore them. With difficulty, I untied the greasy knotted laces. She wore no socks or stockings, and the boot would not budge. It seemed stuck to her skin. I eased a finger down the side and she winced. Leave it be, leave it. I've got to get them off to put you in the bath. Leave it, she whimpered. My Rosie'll do it by and by. But Rosie's not here to help. Sister Evangelina says your boots have got to come off before you have your bath. It would be a long job, so I wrapped a blanket over her and knelt down. Some of the skin was indeed stuck to the leather and tore as I eased the boot back and forth. God knows when they had last come off. Eventually, I eased the boot over her heel and pulled. To my horror, there was a sort of scratching, metallic sound. What had I done? As the boot came off, an extraordinary sight met my eyes. Her toenails were about eight to twelve inches long and up to one inch thick. They were twisted and bent, curling over and under each other, and many of the toes were bleeding and suppurating at the nail bed. The smell was horrible. How had she managed to tramp all over Poplar for so many years with feet like that? I helped her over to the bath, and it was surprisingly difficult. Without her boots, she had lost her balance, and the toenails kept getting in the way, nearly tripping her up. She stepped into the big tin bath and sat down in the water with delight, splashing and giggling like a little girl. She picked up the flannel and sucked the water noisily, looking up at me with smiling eyes. The room was warm because I had stoked up the fire, and a cat strolled up and looked curiously over the edge of the bath. She splashed him in the face with a giggle, and he retreated offended. The front door banged, and she looked up sharply. Rosie, that you? Come here, girl, and look at your old mum. It's a rare sight. But the footsteps went upstairs, and Rosie didn't come. I washed Mrs. Jenkins and wrapped her in the big towels provided by the sisters. I had washed her hair and applied a sassafras compress to kill any nits. The only thing I could not cope with were her toenails. A good chiropodist would have to be called in for such monsters. The nuns always kept a store of second-hand clothes, rescued from many jumble sales, and Sister Evangelina and I had sorted out some garments. Mrs. Jenkins looked at the vest and knickers and stroked the soft material with wonder. Is this for me? Oh, it's too good. You keep them for yourself, ducky. They're too good for the likes of me. I had difficulty in persuading her to put them on, and when she did... She rubbed her hands up and down her thin body with amazement. I quietly put her old clothes out the back door. She settled comfortably in the armchair, stroking her new clothes. Her cat jumped onto her knee and she tickled him gently. What'll Rosie say when she sees all this finery, eh, puss? She won't know her old mum, she won't, dressed up like a queen. I left her with the happy feeling that we were doing a great deal to improve her intolerable conditions. Outside, I looked for a dustbin for her flea-ridden clothes. There were none. Rubbish was piled in the streets. The bomb craters were filled with it and smelled horrible. There was no provision for waste disposal in the area because no one was supposed to be living in the condemned buildings, so no public services were provided. The fact that people were living there, and everyone, including the council, knew about it, made no difference to official policy. I had barely turned the corner when the sound started. I froze. A sort of terror gripped me. It was like the howl of an animal in dreadful pain. The sound echoing off the few buildings and filling the bomb sites with misery. The noise stopped, but I literally couldn't move. Then it started again, and the window in the house opposite opened. The woman who had told me to throw stones leaned out. It's that mad old hag. 
You're looking after her. Tell her to shut up or I'll come and kill her, I will. You tell her from me. The window banged shut. Mad old hag. Mrs. Jenkins? It couldn't be. She couldn't be making that anguished noise. I'd left her contented and happy only a few minutes ago. The noise stopped, and trembling, I went back into the house and down the passage. Rosie? That you, Rosie? I opened the door. Mrs. Jenkins was sitting just as I had left her, with a cat on her knee. She looked up brightly. If you see Rosie, tell her I'm coming. Tell her not to lose heart. Tell her I'm coming. And the little ones and all. I'll scrub and scrub all day, and they'll let me come this time, they will. You tell my Rosie. I was bewildered. She couldn't have made that howling noise. It was impossible. Sister Evangelina took the morning report. I told her that Mrs. Jenkins seemed to enjoy her bath. I reported on the toenails. I reported that her mental condition seemed fairly stable. She loved her new clothes, was chatting companionably to the cats, and was not at all withdrawn and defensive. I hesitated, but finally I told her of the ghastly cry I had heard from the street. Sister looked down at her notes, not moving and when she spoke her voice was subdued. Those who have heard that sound can never forget it. It makes your blood run cold. I will see if we can get hold of any parish records about Mrs. Jenkins. I think the cry you heard was what used to be called the workhouse howl. Her words brought to mind something my grandfather had told me years before about a man he knew who had fallen on hard times. The man had applied to the Board of Guardians for temporary relief and had been told he could not have it, but would be sent to the workhouse. The man replied, I would rather die, and went away and hanged himself. When I was a child, the local workhouse had been pointed out to me with hushed and terrified whispers. Even the empty building seemed to evoke fear and loathing. People would not go down the road in which it stood, or would pass on the other side with faces averted. The dread even affected me, a little child who knew nothing then about the history of the workhouses. The Poor Law Act of 1834 started the workhouse system. The Act was repealed in 1929, but the system lingered on for several decades because there was nowhere else for the inmates to go, and long-term residents had lost the capacity to make any decisions or look after themselves in the outside world. It was intended as a humane and charitable act, because hitherto the destitute could be hounded from place to place, never finding shelter, and could lawfully be beaten to death by their pursuers. To the chronically poor of the 1830s, the workhouse system must have seemed like heaven, a shelter each night, a bed to sleep in, clothing, food, and in return, work to pay for your keep. The system must have seemed like an act of pure Christian goodness and charity, but like so many good intentions, it quickly turned sour. The council supplied Sister Evangelina with the old records of the Board of Guardians of Poplar Workhouse. Mrs. Jenkins had been a pauper inmate from 1916 to 1935. Enough to drive anyone mad, Sister Evie commented. She had been admitted as a widow with five children, unable to support herself. She was described as an able-bodied adult. The record stated that Mrs. Jenkins was discharged in 1935 with the gift of a sewing machine, the use of which would enable her to support herself, and £24, her accumulated earnings after 19 years in the workhouse. No further mention was made of the children. The records were dry and scant, Mrs. Jenkins filled in the missing details in her conversations with Sister Evie. I felt that she had experienced so much suffering for so long that she accepted it as inevitable. A happy life seemed unthinkable to her. She had been born in Millwall, and like most girls had gone to work in a factory at the age of thirteen, then married a local boy when she was eighteen. They rented two rooms over a tailor's shop in Commercial Road, and six children were born to them over the next ten years. Then her young husband developed a cough that did not get better. Six months later, he was spitting blood. 
he just wasted away, she said. Three months later, he was dead. Mrs. Jenkins was strong and less than thirty years of age at the time. She left the two rooms and took a small back room for herself and her children. She returned to work in the shirt-making factory, working from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Her baby was only three months old, but Rosie, her eldest daughter, was already ten and left school in order to look after the younger children. Extra hand sewing was taken in, and she often sat half the night sewing by candlelight. Rosie learnt to sew too, and became a good needlewoman, often sitting up with her mother into the night hours. These silent hours of female labour brought in a little extra money, enough to feed the family after the rent was paid. Then, catastrophe struck. The machinery of the factory was completely unguarded, and the sleeve of Mrs. Jenkins' dress caught in a wheel, dragging her right arm towards the cutting blades. Her arm was badly injured, she lost a lot of blood, and tendons were severed before the machine was stopped. She was lucky not to lose her arm. She showed us the six-inch scar. The lacerations were never stitched because she could not afford to pay a doctor, and the scar, though healed, was wide, deep red, and irregular. Her arm was slightly withered because the tendons had not been sutured. It was surprising that she could use her hand at all. She looked at the scar without emotion. This is what done for us, she said. The family moved out of the back room and found shelter in a basement with no window. It was close to the river's edge, and at high tide, when the water level rose, moisture seeped through the brickwork and ran down the walls. For this hovel... The landlord demanded one shilling a week, but with the mother not earning, how was this to be found? She went out begging, but was driven off the streets by the police, who saw her as an undesirable vagrant. She pawned her coat, and with the money bought matches, then went out into the streets as a match-seller. The profits from her sales brought in a little money, but not enough to pay the rent as well as feed the children. Bit by bit she pawned everything they had the furniture, pots, saucepans, the plates and mugs, clothes, linen. Last to go was the bed in which they all slept. She constructed a platform out of orange boxes to raise them off the damp floor, and on this the family slept. Finally, the blankets had to be pawned, and mother and children clung to each other for warmth at night. She asked the Board of Guardians for outdoor relief, but the chairman said she was obviously lazy and work-shy, and when she told them of the accident in the factory and showed them her right arm, she was told not to be impertinent. The gentlemen debated amongst themselves and offered to take two of her children off her hands. She refused and returned to the basement. With no light, no heat, constant damp and mildew, and virtually no food, the children became sickly. The family struggled on for six months. The mother sold her hair. She sold her teeth. But it was never enough. When the baby died, no money could be spared for burial, so she sealed him in an orange box weighed down with stones and slipped him into the river. That furtive journey in the middle of the night with her dead baby was the moment when she knew that the inevitable had come. She and the children would have to go to the workhouse. Mrs. Jenkins and her children left the basement with three weeks' rent owing. The landlord had threatened to put the whip to her back if she did not pay the following day, so they left during the night. Neither she nor the children had shoes. Their clothes were just rags. Dirty, hungry and shivering, they stood in the unlit street, ringing the great bell outside the workhouse. The door was opened by a thin, grey man who demanded, What do you want? Shelter and food for the little ones. You'll have to come to the reception room. You can sleep there till morning, unless, of course, you're casuals and go to the casual centre. There's no food until morning. No, we are not casuals, she said wearily. They were the only people in the reception room that night. The sleeping platform, a raised wooden construction, 
was covered with fresh straw and looked inviting. They cuddled up in the sweet-smelling hay and the children fell asleep at once. Only the mother lay awake, her heart breaking. She knew it would be the last time she would be allowed to sleep with her children. Morning, and the mistress entered. She took their names and told them to follow her to the wash house, where they were stripped and made to wash all over with cold water. Workhouse uniforms were provided of coarse grey serge. There were a variety of odd shoes. Then their heads were shaved. Mrs. Jenkins did not have to be shaved because she had no hair, having sold it some weeks previously. They were taken to the master's office for segregation. Everyone dreaded this moment, including the master and mistress, and four strong pauper inmates were brought in to take the children away. The master looked at the little ones. Ages, he demanded. Two, four, and five, Mrs. Jenkins whispered. Take them to the children's ward. And the older boy? What age is he? Nine. He'll go to the boys' ward. The girl? he demanded, pointing at Rosie. Ten. Take her to the girls' ward, he ordered. Rough hands were laid on the children. The children were dragged away, screaming, and Mrs. Jenkins was pushed into the women's quarters. Great doors were shut behind her, and keys were turned. She heard the sounds of screaming children and doors banging. Then she heard no more. End of Disc 3 Call the Midwife, Disc 4 Segregation, which seemed so utterly inhuman, was the first rule of all workhouses and rigorously applied. Husbands and wives were separated, parents and children, brothers and sisters. Usually they never saw each other again. If Mrs. Jenkins was odd, it was not surprising. Life in the workhouse was terrible. All inmates were locked into their quarters, which consisted of a day room, a sleeping room and an airing yard. They were confined to the dormitory from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m., and there was a channel running down the centre into which they relieved themselves at night. The day room was their dining room, where they sat at long benches to eat. All windows were above eye level, so no one could see out. The airing yard was an enclosed gravel square from which no door or gate issued. It was, effectively, a prison. Misery and monotony blurred days into weeks and weeks into months. The women worked all day, mostly rough work, in the laundry, washing for the entire workhouse, scrubbing, cooking poor quality food for all the inmates, heavy sewing such as sacks and sails, and strangest of all, picking oakum. This was old rope, usually tarred, which had to be untwisted and unpicked into strands, which were then used for caulking the seams of wooden ships. The rope, especially if caked in oil or tar or salt, could be as hard as steel, and unpicking it tore the hands and left the fingers raw and bleeding. Yet the working hours were less terrible than the hours of rest. Mrs. Jenkins found herself among about one hundred other women of all ages, including the sick and infirm. Many appeared to be mad or demented. There was nowhere to sit down, except on benches in the day room or the airing yard. In order to rest themselves, the women sat back to back on a bench, each supporting the other. There was nothing to do, nothing to look at or listen to, no books, nothing with which to exercise the mind. Many of the women just walked round and round in circles. Most of them talked to themselves or rocked backwards and forwards continuously. Some moaned aloud or howled into the night air. They were ushered into the airing yard twice a day for half an hour of exercise. From the yard, Mrs. Jenkins could hear the sounds of children's voices, but the walls were fifteen feet high and she could not see over them. She tried calling the names of her children, but was ordered to stop or she wouldn't be allowed into the yard again. So she just stood by the wall where she thought the sounds came from, whispering their names and straining her ears to catch the sound of a voice she would know to be her child's own. 
I didn't know what I'd done wrong to be in there, and I didn't know what they'd done with the little ones. When the spring came, Mrs Jenkins was informed that her youngest child, a boy aged three, had died. She asked why, and was told that he had always been sickly and that no one had expected him to live. She asked if she might attend the funeral, and was told he had already been buried. Mrs Jenkins never saw any of her children again. Over the next four years, one by one, they all died. The mother was merely informed of each death. She was given no cause. She did not attend any of the funerals. The last to die was a girl of fourteen. Her name was Rosie. At the church hall, the antenatal clinic had been set up. It was midwinter, and the coke stove was burning fiercely. There were seven piles of notes with about ten folders in each pile. I glanced at the top of the first pile and saw the name Brenda, a woman of forty-six with rickets. She would be admitted to hospital for a caesarean, but we were looking after her antenatally. I took her for examination and check-up. My heart went out to little Brenda. For centuries it was not known what caused rickets. The child was thought to be puny or even just lazy, as rachitic children always stand and walk very late. The bones are shortened and bend under pressure. The spine is deformed, and the rib cage is barreled and frequently twisted in shape. The head is large and square-shaped, with a jutting lower jaw. Frequently the teeth drop out. As if these deformities were not enough, rachitic children always had a lower immunity to infection. The condition was common throughout northern Europe, and no one knew what caused it, until in the 1930s it was found to be due to a lack of vitamin D in the diet, causing deficiency of calcium in the bone. Such a simple reason for so much suffering. Vitamin D is found abundantly in milk, meat, eggs, and especially in meat fat and fish oils. You would think most children would have had an adequate diet of these items, but not poor children from deprived backgrounds. Vitamin D can also be made spontaneously in the body by the effect of ultraviolet rays on the skin. But the sun was not for poor children in industrial cities, where the density of buildings virtually blocked out the natural light, and where children had to work long hours in factories and workshops or workhouses. So these children grew up crippled. Brenda beamed at me, alight with eager anticipation. She knew she would have to have a caesarean section, but that did not bother her. She was going to have a baby, and this time it would live. That was all that mattered to her, and she was intensely grateful to the sisters, the hospital, the doctors, but above all to the National Health Service and the wonderful people who had arranged that everything should be free. Brenda's obstetric history was tragic. She had married young and in the 1930s had had four pregnancies. Every baby had died. The tragedy for a woman with rickets is that, along with all the other bones, the pelvis is also deformed, and the baby therefore cannot be delivered, or only with great difficulty. Brenda had had four long, obstructed labours, and each time the baby had died. She was lucky not to have died herself. It will never be known how many women died of exhaustion in the agony of obstructed labour, the poor were expendable, and their numbers not counted. Where was it I had read in some ancient manual for the instruction of women attending the lying in? If a woman is in labour for more than ten or twelve days, you should seek a doctor's aid. Ten or twelve days of obstructed labour in the hands of what in those days would have been an untrained woman. I had to thank God that obstetric practice had moved on. Yet even in my training days, the most up-to-date textbooks taught that a woman with a rachitic pelvis should have a trial labour of eight to twelve hours to test the endurance of both mother and fetus. Brenda had been subjected to four such trial labours in the 1930s. Why on earth, after the first, it had not been agreed that she should have a caesarean section for the delivery of subsequent babies, I could not imagine. Possibly she could not afford to pay for it, because before 1948 all medical treatment had to be paid for. Brenda's husband, 
had been killed on active service in 1940, so she had not had any more pregnancies. However, at the age of 43, she had married again, and now she was pregnant once more. Her joy at the prospect of a living baby seemed to fill the antenatal clinic and throw everything else into shadow. She called out, Hello, sis, how's yourself? to everyone in sight, and to queries about her health, she responded, I'm wonderful, never been better, on top of the world all the time. I followed her over to the couch, and it stabbed my heart to see her little bow legs struggling to carry her. I had to arrange two stools and a chair before she could climb onto the couch, but she managed it with awkward movements. She was panting and beaming in triumph when she got up. It seemed that every difficulty in life was a challenge to her, and every one successfully overcome was an occasion for rejoicing. She was not, by any stretch of the imagination, a good-looking woman, but I was not at all surprised that she had found a second husband who, I had no doubt, loved her. Brenda was only six months pregnant, but her abdomen looked abnormally large due to her tiny stature, and also to the inward curving of the spine, which pushed the uterus forward and upwards. We saw her every week for the next six weeks, and she struggled on with increasing difficulty, using two sticks to help her get about. Her happiness never left her, and she never complained. At thirty-seven weeks, she was admitted to the London Hospital for bed rest, and a caesarean section was successfully carried out at thirty-nine weeks. A fine, healthy daughter was delivered, whom she called Grace Miracle. Conchita Warren was expecting her twenty-fifth baby. She was in perfect condition again, and did not really look pregnant until about twenty-four weeks. Len was all excitement and anticipation, as though this were only his second or third baby. It was winter, and very cold and icy. Heavy snow clouds hung over the city, trapping the smoke fumes from all the coal fires, steam trains and steam engines, the profuse smoke from the ocean-going vessels, and above all the factories, which were largely fueled by coal. A thick London smog developed. One can have no conception these days of what they were like. The air would be heavy, foul-smelling, and a thick, yellowish-grey colour. It was impossible to see more than a yard ahead, even at midday. The only way a vehicle could move would be for a man to walk ahead of it, carrying two bright lights, one to shine ahead so he could find his way, and the other shining behind him for the vehicle to follow. These smogs lasted until the atmospheric pressure lifted, allowing the trapped fumes to escape. Conchita must have gone into the backyard for something. She either slipped on the ice or tripped over something she could not see. She must have fallen heavily and lay partly concussed on the freezing concrete for some time. The only children in the house were the little ones under five. She was found by the other children when they came home from school. It is a miracle she did not die of exposure. Conchita was in a bad way, and that night she went into labour. The phone rang at about 11.30 p.m. I was aghast, firstly because of the premature labour, and secondly because of the weather conditions. How on earth was I to find my way to Limehouse? I was speaking to one of the elder sons, who briefly explained the circumstances. My first question was, have you called the doctor? Yes, he had, but the doctor was out. Well, you must keep trying, I said. If your mother was concussed and her temperature dropped a lot, she may need medical treatment quite apart from the pregnancy. Ring the doctor again now. He may have difficulty getting to you, but so will I. I replaced the telephone and looked out of the window. I couldn't see a thing. We had hardly been out for three days, hoping and praying that no one would go into labour before the smog lifted. I went up to the sister's floor to call Sister Julienne. Nuns go to bed at about nine o'clock because they get up before four a.m. for the first office of the day, so eleven-thirty would be the middle of the night for them. Nevertheless, with the first light tap on the door, Sister was awake. She joined me in the corridor, wearing a coarse brown wool dressing gown and, amazingly, her veil. The question, does she go to bed in the thing, flashed through my mind. It must be damned uncomfortable. But there was no time to reflect upon the habit of a nun. 
I told her briefly the story that had been given to me over the telephone. She thought for a moment and said, Limehouse is over three miles away. You might not get there. There is no point in me or any of the midwives coming with you, because two people can get lost just as easily as one. You must have a police escort. Go now and ring the police, and God be with you, my dear. I will pray for Conchita Warren and her unborn baby. The knowledge that Sister Julienne would be praying for us had an extraordinary effect. All the tension and anxiety left me, and I felt calm and confident. I had learned to respect the power of prayer. What change had come over the headstrong young girl who only a year earlier had found the whole idea of prayer to be a joke? I spoke to the police and told them it was an emergency. The policeman said, There is no point in sending a car, because you can't see further than the bonnet, and we would have to have a man walking ahead. We will send a bicycle escort. I said I would be ready within ten minutes. All my thoughts were with Conchita. I did not think the baby was likely to survive at around twenty-eight weeks gestation. Finding the bicycle shed in the smog and loading my bike was a tricky business, but I was at the front of Nonata's house in less than ten minutes. Two policemen arrived shortly after, on bicycles with very powerful lights, front and rear, which illuminated about two yards. One rode ahead of me, the other beside me, I being on the curb side. Thus, we progressed with surprising speed, because there was no other traffic. Looking back over nearly half a century, it seems absurd to be racing to an emergency labour on bicycles at ten miles per hour, but even today I can think of no better way. We arrived at the Warren household in less than fifteen minutes. Liz let us in, and she and I went upstairs to Conchita. She looked ghastly, deathly white, with bright pink splodges under her eyes. I took her temperature, which was a hundred and three degrees Fahrenheit. At first I could not feel her pulse, but on careful counting I found it to be a hundred and twenty and intermittent. Her blood pressure was barely perceptible. Her breathing was shallow and rapid at around forty breaths per minute. I watched in silence for a couple of minutes as a contraction came on. It was powerful and her features distorted in pain, a high-pitched groan emanating from her throat. Her eyes were open, but I don't think she could see anyone. Len was cradling her in his arms. The suffering on his face was enough to break your heart. I inquired if the doctor had been called. He had, but was still out. The call had been put through to another doctor, who was also out with a patient. All doctors worked terribly hard at these times. The London smogs were notorious killers, causing acute and deadly respiratory failure in thousands of old people. I said we should arrange for a hospital admission as soon as possible. It was obvious that Conchita could easily die, especially if complications arose from labour and delivery. I went and spoke to the policemen who were in the kitchen. One said he would telephone the hospital. The other one undertook to try to find one of the local GPs and escort him to the house. How an ambulance would get there and back was an open question. I returned to Conchita and started to lay out my delivery things. It was possible that I would be alone with a premature delivery and a sick and possibly dying woman. Suddenly I remembered that Sister Julienne was praying for us. Again, the relief was overwhelming. All my fears vanished, and the calm certainty that all would be well flooded my mind and body. I remembered the words of Mother Julian of Norwich, All shall be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things shall be well. I must have given a great sigh of relief, which Len picked up. He said, You reckon as I should be all right then, do you? Should I tell him that Sister Julian was praying for us? I did. He didn't dismiss it. Well, I reckons as how it's going to be all right then, too. It would have been advisable to examine Conchita vaginally to see how far she was in labour, but I couldn't get her into the right position. She wouldn't allow Len or me to move her. I could only assess the progress of labour from the strength and frequency of contractions, which were approximately every five minutes. I listened for the fetal heart, but couldn't hear a thing. Is the baby alive, then? asked Len. It's unlikely. 
Remember, your wife got very, very cold today and has been unconscious. Now she has a fever. All this will affect the baby. I cannot hear a heartbeat. One of the real problems of premature delivery at the stage of pregnancy Conchita had reached is that the fetus is often lying transversely across the uterus, and a transverse or shoulder delivery is impossible. The head does not normally descend into the pelvis until after 36 weeks. A fetus of around 28 weeks is quite large enough to block the cervix completely if contractions push it downwards in the transverse position. In that event, without surgical intervention, the death of the baby is inevitable. I palpated the uterus, trying to find out the baby's position, but I could not tell. The contractions were coming every three minutes now. Her pulse was more rapid, 150 per minute, and her breathing seemed to be more shallow. Her blood pressure was quite imperceptible. The house was silent, save for the low moaning of Conchita. Inevitably, the contractions became stronger, and it was then that Conchita began to scream. I have never in my life before or since heard such terrifying sounds. They came from the depths of her suffering body with a force and power that I would have thought impossible, given her fevered, debilitated state. She screamed on and on, wild terror in her unseeing eyes. She clung to her husband, tore at him, until his face and chest and arms were bleeding. He tried to hold her to comfort her, but she was beyond comfort. I felt helpless. I did not dare to give her an analgesic to quieten her, because her pulse and blood pressure were so abnormal. Any drugs would probably kill her. I thought that if it was a transverse presentation, she would die, unless an ambulance were to arrive quickly. I could not get near her. She was throwing herself around the bed with the strength of a wild animal in a trap. Poor Liz looked terrified. Len, with unconditional love, was still trying to hold her in his arms. She sank her teeth into his hand and hung on. He winced with pain, sweat and tears falling from his forehead and eyes. He didn't even try to force her jaw open or to pull away. With alarm, I thought she would sever a tendon. Eventually she loosed the hand and flung herself to the other side of the bed. Then she gave a terrible cry and a massive push, and water, blood, fetus, placenta, everything was delivered onto the bed sheets at once. She fell back, exhausted. I could feel no pulse at all. Her breathing seemed to have stopped. But I could feel a flutter of a heartbeat, so I listened with my stethoscope. It was faint and irregular, but it was there. The fetus was blue and looked quite dead. I snatched a kidney dish, scooped everything into it, and dumped it on the dresser. Now, we must quickly get her warm, I said, cleaned up and comfortable if she is to stand a chance. Liz, clean warm sheets, a couple of hot water bottles. I will check the placenta in a minute to see if it is complete. If we can get her to drink something hot, it will help. Hot water and honey would do. A teaspoon of brandy in it would be even better. The main thing is to treat the shock, and let us all hope and pray that the bleeding won't get worse. Len went out to pacify the terrified family gathered around the door. Liz and I started to clean the dirty sheets and linen from under Conchita. Len returned with clean sheets and hot water bottles, and Liz and I started to make the inert body comfortable. Len must have gone over to the dresser. Liz and I had our backs to it, busy with Conchita. We heard a gasp. It's alive! The baby's alive! It's moving! I rushed over to the dresser and looked at the gory mess in the kidney dish. It moved. The blood actually moved. My heart stood still. Then I saw the tiny creature in the pool of blood and its leg moved. Oh, dear God, I could have drowned it. I lifted the tiny body with one hand and tilted it upside down. It seemed to weigh nothing. I've held a newborn puppy of about the same size. My head raced. We must clamp and cut the cord quickly. Then we must get him warm. I felt desperately guilty. The cord should have been clamped five minutes earlier. If he dies now, it will be my fault, I thought. 
I had discarded this tiny living soul to drown in a dish of blood. I should have looked more closely. But wallowing in self-reproach gets us nowhere. I clamped and cut the cord. Len had warmed a small towel and we wrapped him in the cloth. He moved his head and arms. All three of us were stunned by the life in the baby. None of us had seen a human child quite so tiny. A baby that is two months premature usually weighs about four pounds and seems tiny enough. This baby was about one and a half pounds and looked like a tiny doll. His arms and legs were much smaller than my little finger, yet a minuscule nail completed each digit. His head was smaller than a ping-pong ball, and his rib cage looked like fish bones. He had tiny ears, and his nostrils were the size of a pinhead. I had never imagined that a baby of around twenty-eight weeks could be so lovely. I felt I ought to suck the mucus from his throat, but was terrified of hurting him. Anyway, the catheter was far too large, so I just held him nearly upside down with one hand and gently rubbed his back with one finger. I had no experience of caring for a premature baby and did not know what to do. All my instincts told me that he must be kept warm and quiet, preferably in the dark and with frequent feeding. Where could we put him? Just then, Conchita, who was lying quietly, spoke. Nino. Minino, donde esta minino? Baby, my baby, where is my baby? We looked at each other. We gotta give him to her. Liz, you tell her he's very little and we gotta be very careful with him. Liz spoke to her mother, who smiled slightly and sighed with weariness. Len took the baby from me and sat down beside his wife. He held the baby in one hand so the child lay within her gaze. Her eyes had become vacant and unfocused, and I don't think she saw or understood at first. Liz spoke to her again. El niño es muy pequeño. The baby is very small. Conchita struggled to adjust her vision to the minute scrap held in Len's hand. You could almost see the struggle and effort it cost her. Gradually she became aware and with a sharp intake of breath put out a shaking hand to touch the child. She smiled and murmured, Mi niño, mi querido niño, my baby, my darling baby, and drifted off to sleep, her hand resting on Len's hand and the baby. Just then, the flying squad arrived. An obstetric flying squad was provided by most big London hospitals as an emergency backup for domiciliary midwifery. The service must have saved thousands of lives because before the 1940s, when no service existed, a midwife could find herself entirely alone with any obstetric emergency, a malpresentation, hemorrhage, cord prolapse or placenta previa. It was the proud boast of the flying squad of the London hospital that it could reach any obstetric emergency in 20 minutes. But that was reckoning without a London smog, hence the delay of nearly three hours. However, a registrar, a houseman, and a nurse from the obstetrics department had been sent by the hospital. Everything happens at once, so they say, and within minutes a GP arrived on foot. God bless him, I thought. He looked exhausted. He'd been working all day and all night, yet he had the professionalism and the courtesy to apologise for being late. With so much medical know-how in the house, it was necessary to have a case conference to decide the best course of action for mother and baby. We went down to the kitchen for this, and I asked Len to accompany me. Liz was left with her mother and the baby. I gave my case history and handed over the recorded notes. All doctors were agreed that mother and baby must be transferred to hospital at once. Len was alarmed. Does she have to go? She won't like it. She's never been away from home before, she hasn't. She'll be lost and frightened. I knows as how she would. We can look after her. I'll stop at home and the girls can muck in and all till she's better. The doctors looked at one another and sighed. Fear of hospital was commonplace. They agreed that as Conchita was now safely delivered, if no postnatal complications arose, she probably could be treated at home. 
A course of antibiotics would clear the infection that was causing the fever. The head injury causing concussion and delirium would heal with rest and quiet. However, the baby was another matter. He hadn't been weighed, but my guess of between one and a half and two pounds was accepted. They all said twenty-eight weeks was barely viable, and that a living baby of that gestation must have hospital treatment with the latest technological equipment and twenty-four-hour expert nursing. They suggested that he should be transferred at once to Great Ormond Street Hospital for sick children. Len looked dubious, but when they told him that without such care the baby would die, he readily agreed. We all went upstairs to the bedroom. Conchita was sleeping, the tiny baby lying on her chest. One hand was protectively over it, the other lay limp by her side. She was smiling, and her breathing, although shallow, was regular and less rapid. I felt her pulse. It was slightly stronger and regular, but still rapid. I counted 120 per minute, which, though abnormal, was an improvement. Liz was cleaning up quietly and efficiently, and the whole scene was peaceful. The baby looked even smaller now that the entire hand of the mother covered it. Only its head was visible. It did not really look as if it were alive, although its colour did not suggest death. The registrar wanted to examine Conchita. I told him that I had not yet examined the placenta, as I had not had time between delivery and the arrival of the ambulance. We examined it together. It was very ragged. Not hopeful, he muttered. And it all came out at once, you tell me? I must have a look at her. He pulled back the bedclothes to examine her abdomen and see the vaginal discharge. Conchita seemed quite unconscious and didn't move as he palpated the uterus. Some blood rushed out. Another pad, he said, and to the houseman, draw me up half a cc of ergometrin for injection. He sank the needle deep into her gluteus muscle, but she didn't move. He covered her and said to Len, I think part of the placenta has been left behind. The next five minutes will tell if the injection is going to be effective. He then took Conchita's blood pressure. I can hear nothing, he said, and the three doctors exchanged significant glances. Len groaned and had to sit down. His daughter put her hand on his shoulder, and he squeezed it. We all waited. The registrar said, There is no point in examining the baby. It is obviously alive, but we are none of us paediatricians. Examination must wait for the experts. He asked for the telephone, to ring Great Ormond Street Hospital, but there was no telephone in the house. He cursed silently under his breath, and asked where he could find the nearest phone box. It was two hundred yards down the road. The long-suffering houseman was dispatched out into the freezing fog and icy roads, with a pocket full of pennies gleaned from us all, to ring the hospital and make the necessary arrangements. We continued waiting. There was no sign of an abdominal contraction. Five minutes slipped by. The houseman returned to say that Great Ormond Street would send a paediatrician and a nurse with an incubator and special equipment to collect the baby at once, although the time of their arrival depended on visibility. Another five minutes passed. There was steady vaginal bleeding, but no contractions. Draw up another half cc, the registrar said. We must give it intravenously. There is something in there that has to come out. If we can't get it this way, he said to Len, we will have to take her back with us for a D&C, and if you value her life, you must agree to this. Len groaned and nodded dumbly. I clamped the upper arm and endeavoured to pump up a vein for injection, but nothing showed. Her blood pressure was so low that the venous return could not be found. The registrar tried with a couple of stabs to locate the vein, and on the third attempt, blood showed in the syringe. He emptied the half cc into her vein, and I released the arm. Within a minute, Conchita winced in pain and moved her legs. A large quantity of fresh blood spurted from her vagina, and then, mercifully, several large, darker lumps. There was a pause, then a second contraction. The registrar grasped the fundus and pressed the uterus hard, downwards and backwards. More blood and placenta were evacuated. All this time Conchita was inert, 
but I thought I saw her hand tighten over her baby. That might be it, said the registrar, but we must wait a bit longer to see. He was more relaxed now, and started chatting with anyone who would listen about the excellent golf down at Greenwich, and the house he was buying at Dulwich, and his holiday in Scotland. Over the next ten minutes there was no further blood loss and no more contractions. Thanks to modern obstetrics, the danger of postpartum hemorrhage had been overcome for Conchita, but she still looked very ill indeed. Her breathing and pulse were rapid, her blood pressure abnormally low and her temperature high. She did not appear to be conscious, although as her eyes were now closed she might have been asleep. Nonetheless, her hand was still firmly placed over the baby, and any attempt to remove it was resisted. With difficulty, Liz and I cleaned up the bed again, and the houseman was given the messy job of checking the bits of placenta against the larger piece that had first been delivered, and measuring the blood that we had managed to contain. Placenta seems to be all here, sir, and I measure one and a half pints of blood. Add to that about eight ounces lost in the bed, and you could say around two pints of blood loss. The registrar muttered to himself, then said aloud, she really needs a transfusion. Her blood pressure is already low. Can we do it here? he added, turning to the GP. Yes, I'll take a sample now for cross-matching. I had wondered why the GP had remained all the while when he could have left. Now it became clear to me. He anticipated having ongoing responsibility for Conchita if she was to be cared for at home, and he wanted full cognizance of the facts. At that moment, the ambulance arrived from Great Ormond Street to collect the baby. The paraphernalia and personnel that emerged from the second ambulance was overwhelming. A doctor came hurrying past, carrying an incubator. Another followed with a ventilating machine. A nurse followed with a huge box. Two ambulance men and the policeman came last, each carrying oxygen cylinders. All this equipment had to be manoeuvred past the three coach prams and two ladders lining the hallway. The washing hanging overhead didn't help because it got caught up on the equipment and several small dainty items personal to the young ladies of the house were transported upstairs. The children, who had been in and out of bed all night, hung over the banisters and hid in doorways to get the full impact of the procession. On reaching the bedroom, the medical staff entered, whilst the policeman and the ambulance men were directed down to the kitchen to join their colleagues for tea. Nevertheless, the bedroom, of average size, now contained five doctors, two nurses, a midwife, and Len and Liz. There was equipment everywhere. My delivery instrument still covered the dresser. The obstetrician's was on the chest of drawers. The paediatrician's had to be left on the floor whilst we hastily cleared space. I think we'll push off now, said the registrar to his colleague. I'm very glad to see you. The mother is to be nursed at home. Good luck with the baby. They left, but the GP remained. The paediatrician looked at the baby and gasped. Think he'll make it, sir? asked the young doctor. We'll have a damn good try, said the paediatric registrar. Fix up the oxygen and the suction and heat up the incubator. The team got busy. The paediatrician leaned over Conchita to take the baby. You could not tell whether she was asleep or semi-conscious, but the muscles of her arm tightened and she held the baby fast. He said to Len, Would you tell her to let me have the baby, please? I've got to examine him before we can transport him. Len leaned over his wife and murmured to her, trying to loosen her hand. It tightened, and her other hand came up to cover the first. Liz, love, you tell your mum we've got to have the baby to take to hospital. He shook her gently, trying to waken her. Her eyes flickered and opened a little. Liz bent over her and spoke to her in Spanish. None of us could tell what she said. Conchita opened her eyes more and tried to focus on the little creature lying on her chest. No, she said. Liz spoke to her again, more persuasively and urgently this time. No, said her mother. Liz tried a third time. Morira, morira, he will die. The effect on Conchita was dramatic and immediate. 
she opened her eyes wide, desperately trying to focus on the people around her. She saw the equipment and the white coats. I think her clouded brain took it all in and she struggled to sit up. Liz and Len helped her. She looked wildly round at everyone, thrust the baby down between her breasts and folded her arms over him. No, she said, then repeated louder. No! Mama, you must, said Liz softly. Si no lo haces morirá. If you don't, he will die. Conchita's face was blank with anguish, but something was going on in her mind. One could almost see her struggling to get her thoughts under her command. Struggling to think, to remember, she held her breasts and the tiny baby fast and glanced down at his head. The sight of it must have been the catalyst that brought it all together for her. Her mind seemed to clear, and a fierce, determined look came into her huge black eyes. She looked round at each of the people in the room, her eyes finally clear and focused, and said with perfect confidence, No, se cuida conmigo, he stays with me. No morirá. Then, with more emphasis, No morirá, he will not die. The doctors didn't know what to do. The paediatrician said to Liz, Tell her that she can't look after it. She hasn't got the equipment or the know-how. Tell her the baby will be taken to the finest children's hospital in the world and will have expert treatment. Tell her he cannot live without an incubator. Liz started to speak, but Len stepped in and showed his true strength. He turned to the doctors and nurse. This is all my fault, and I must apologise. I said the baby could go to hospital without consulting my wife. I shouldn't have done that. When it comes to the kiddies, she must always have the last word she must. And she done agree to it. You can see she done. And so, the baby's not going nowhere. He'll stop here with us, and he'll be christened. And if he dies, he'll have a Christian burial. But he's not going nowhere without his mother's consent. He looked at his wife, and she smiled and stroked the baby's head. She seemed to understand that he was on her side, and the battle was over. She looked at him with confident love and said quietly, No morirá. There you are, said Len buoyantly. He won't die. If my Connie says that, then he won't die. You can take it from me. And that was that. The doctors knew they were defeated and started to pack up their equipment. Len graciously apologised a second time, thanked them for the trouble they had taken, and said again that it was all his fault. He offered to pay for the expense of the ambulance and the time of the medical and nursing staff. He offered them a cup of tea in the kitchen. They declined. He gave them one of his winning smiles and said, Go on, have a cup. You've got a long journey and it'll warm you. He had such an engaging way about him that everyone agreed to accept the hospitality, even though they were cross about the wasted journey. He and Liz helped the team downstairs with all their equipment, and the GP and I were left alone. He had hardly spoken during the past three hours or so, and I liked him for this. We knew that we had a huge responsibility, and that both mother and baby could still die. With the loss of two pints of blood, Conchita's condition was critical. She must have blood, said the GP. I have taken a sample for cross-matching, and as soon as the blood bank can supply it, I will set up an IV. We will need a district nurse to stay with her while it's going in. Can you sisters provide one? I told him I was sure of it. He said, I'm going to start antibiotics at once because she is breathing only into the upper lobes. I would like to listen to her chest, but I doubt if she will let me because of the baby. He was right, she wouldn't. So he drew up an ampoule of penicillin and injected it into the thigh. She must have one ampoule IM for seven days BD, he said, as he entered it on his notes and wrote out a prescription. Now I'm going to try and see about this blood. That's as much as I can do at present. Frankly, nurse, I don't know what to do about the baby. I think I will have to leave it to you and the sisters. They are sure to have more experience than I have. Or me, I said. I have never handled a premature baby before. We looked at each other with shared helplessness, and he left. Bless him, I thought. 
He hadn't had any sleep for God knows how long. It was about 5 a.m., it was a filthy morning, and now he was leaving, on foot, in thick fog, to try to get the blood sorted out. And no doubt he had a surgery at 9 a.m. and a full day's work after that. I was so tired I could scarcely think. The adrenaline had been pumping all night, and now my body was drained. Conchita was sleeping. The baby could have been alive or dead for all I knew. I tried to think if there was anything I could do, but my brain wouldn't work. Should I go back to Nonata's house? How could I get there? The policeman had gone, and I couldn't face the prospect of cycling alone in the fog. Just then Liz came in with a cup of tea. Sit yourself down, lovey, and have a rest, she said. I sat down in the armchair. I remember drinking half a cup of tea, and then the next moment it was daylight. Len was in the room, sitting on the bed, brushing Conchita's hair and murmuring sweet nothings to her. She was smiling at him and the baby. He saw me waken and said, Feel better now, nurse. It's ten o'clock, and it said on the news that the fog will start to lift today. I looked at Conchita, who was sitting up in bed, the baby still between her breasts. She was stroking his little head and cooing to him. She looked pathetically weak, but her skin colour and her breathing had improved. Above all, her eyes were still focusing, and she looked collected. The delirium from concussion had quite gone. From then on, she improved rapidly. No doubt the penicillin helped, but alone it could not have affected the astonishing transformation within a few hours from someone close to death, who didn't even know her own husband, to a calm, competent woman who knew exactly what she was doing and why. I have a theory that it was the living baby that cured her, and that the crisis had occurred when she thought they were going to take him away. In that moment, her powerful maternal instincts had kicked in and told her that she was the protector, the provider. She didn't have time to be ill. She couldn't afford to be woolly-minded. His life depended on her. Had the baby died at birth, or had he been taken away to hospital, I think Conchita would have died also. Now Conchita reached for a saucer at the side of her and began to squeeze her nipples, pressing out a few drops of colostrum which fell into the saucer. Then she took a fine glass rod, which was used by one of her daughters for icing cakes. She held the little baby in her left hand, and having suspended a drop of colostrum on the glass rod, touched his lips with it. I watched, fascinated. His lips were no bigger than a couple of daisy petals. A tiny tongue came out and licked the fluid. She repeated this about six or eight times, then tucked him back between her breasts. Len said, She's been doing this every half hour since six o'clock. Then they both have a little sleep, and she does it again. She said he won't die, and he won't, you know. She knows how to look after him. I checked that she was not bleeding unduly and left. I had to get back to Nonata's house to report, and to request a district nurse to monitor the blood transfusion when it arrived. The smog was beginning to lift, and one could just about see across the road. It felt as though the world was filling with new life as the foul smog cleared, and I cycled back with a light heart. Conchita didn't lose any more blood. After the transfusion, colour returned to her cheeks and also to Lens. She was weak, but all danger had passed. The baby lay on her breast, day and night, fed in the manner that I have described about every half hour, all the lay staff and sisters from Nonata's house came to see the two of them. It was such a beautiful and unusual sight. On the fourth day, I weighed the baby in a handkerchief. He was one pound ten ounces. After three weeks, Conchita began to get up for short periods. She had asked Liz to acquire several lengths of the finest unbleached silk. With the help of her skilled eldest daughter, she fixed a kind of sling or firm blouse around her shoulders and breasts, tight underneath but loose above. The baby was carried in this for five months, between his mother's breasts, never leaving her. Who had taught her this? I have never before or since in any literature 
heard of such a way of caring for a premature baby. Was it purely maternal instinct? Possibly today, her decision to refuse hospitalization for the baby would have been overruled by court order, the assumption being that only trained staff and advanced technology can adequately care for a premature child. In the 1950s, we were less intrusive into family life, and I am forced to the conclusion that modern medicine does not know it all. Admittedly, Conchita was lucky. The speed of delivery might have caused brain damage to the baby, but this did not occur. Apart from that, the great danger for a premature baby arises from immature vital organs, especially lungs and liver. The baby did indeed become very jaundiced, more than once in the first few months, but each time it passed. It was a miracle, after I had heedlessly left the baby in a kidney dish, that his lungs were not wholly or even partly collapsed from birth. I can take no credit for that. However, the fact is, he breathed. I like to think that by holding him upside down and tapping his fragile back with a finger, I facilitated his first breath. His mother was advised to do the same after each feed, because if fluid enters the trachea, a premature baby cannot cough as a full-term baby would. She was also given a very fine suction tube and shown how to use it. Apart from that, which was very little, the baby received no medical treatment. The constant temperature of his mother's skin kept his body temperature stable. Possibly the constant rise and fall of her breathing helped him over the first critical weeks. I'm sure that her feeding policy, a few drops of breast milk placed on the lips at frequent intervals, was the right one. She even did this all through the night, I was told. Conchita took no precautions about sterilising her feeding equipment. I doubt if she had ever heard of such a thing. The saucer and the glass rod were simply wiped clean after each use, ready for the next time. The baby survived. Either he is the ultimate survivor, or we put far too much emphasis on technology and techniques, I thought. We visited three times a day, every day, for six weeks then twice a day for a further six weeks. Domiciliary care was good in those days. At four months he weighed six and a half pounds and was responding with smiles and turning his head. He reached out a tiny hand to grasp a finger. He gurgled and chuckled to himself. I was told he hardly ever cried. Several times in those postnatal months I thought of that dreadful night when he was born and remembered Sister Julian's words to me as I left. God be with you, my dear. I will pray for Conchita Warren and her unborn baby. In fact, she prayed for us all. Sister Monica Joan smiled at us indulgently as we sat round the kitchen table. I remember a young man shut in a wardrobe at Queen Charlotte's Hospital. He was locked in for three hours. It would have been perfectly all right, and no one would have found out, but the foolish fellow had borrowed his father's horse and tied it to the hospital railings. Now, you can hide a young man in a wardrobe or under a bed, but how, I ask, can you hide a horse? With a gasp, I realized that these memories dated back to the 1890s. What happened? But she wouldn't remember. I only remember the horse tied to the railings. What a pity. I wanted to hear more. I asked if she had not found the discipline and petty restrictions of nursing to be intolerable. Not a bit of it. After the confinement and restraints of family life, nursing was freedom and adventure. With a slightly quizzical expression in her fine eyes, she had looked around at us. You are all so young. Youth is the first fair flower of spring. Lifting her head, she spread out her eloquent hands towards us. Her face was radiant, her eyes shining, her voice joyful and triumphant. Therefore, sing, my darling, sing, before your petals fade, to feed the flowers of another spring. We were spellbound. Let us go with God and accept the unacceptable. It is a lonely walk into the mind's retreat. 
I could listen to Sister Monica Joan all day. The voice, the hooded eyes, the arch of her haughty eyebrows, the drape of her veil as she turned her long neck. She was over ninety, and her mind was going, but I was utterly captivated. Without doubt she was highly intelligent, well-informed, and in some ways deeply learned, though it was often hard to disentangle the muddled strands of her discourse. Shining questions, infinite response, the astromental plane of man lies in the etheric. The outer darkness is a monstrous dragon with its tail in its mouth, did you know? I sat at her feet, bewitched, and shook my head, not daring to speak in case I broke the spell. Can you smell burning, my dear? No, can you? I think that Mrs. B.'s aromatic unconsciousness has prompted her to make a cake. Let us go with God in all things. I think we should investigate, don't you? The smell of cake for Sister Monica Joan was irresistible. She smiled appreciatively. That smells like one of Mrs. B.'s honey cakes. Come on, get a move on, don't just sit there. She jumped up and with quick light steps, head held high, back straight, she sped towards the kitchen. Mrs. B. turned as she entered. Hello, Sister Monica Joan, you're a bit early. They're not done yet, but I've kept the bowl for you to scrape if you wants to. Sister Monica Joan pounced on the bowl, scraping with the big wooden spoon and licking both sides with murmurs of delight. The bell sounded for tears. Sister Monica Joan looked round quickly and winked. I must go. You can wash the bowl now. Oh, the delight in heaven as the spheres move and the tiny grains of sand touch the stars. The phoenix rises from the living flame and Ceres cries, Don't forget to keep the crispy ones for me. She tripped out of the kitchen as Mrs. B fondly opened the door for her. She's a caution, she is. You wouldn't think she'd been in the docks all through two world wars and the Depression, would you? She's delivered thousands of our children. In the Blitz, she wouldn't leave. She delivered babies in air raid shelters and church crypts, and once in what was left of a bombed house. Bless her. If she wants the crispy ones, she can have them. I had heard stories like that so often from so many people. Her years of selfless work, her dedication, her commitment... Sister Monica Joan was known and loved throughout Poplar. I had heard that she was the daughter of a very aristocratic English family who was scandalised when she announced in the 1890s that she was going to be a nurse. Wasn't her sister a countess and her mother a lady in her own right? How could she disgrace them so? Ten years later, when she qualified as one of the first midwives in the country, they remained silent in their displeasure. But they cut her off altogether when she joined a religious order and went to work in the East End of London. Whilst I was fascinated and captivated by Sister Monica Joan, I could not for the life of me decide if she really was verging on senility or not. Flashes of brilliance and flashes of senility crossed and recrossed each other in lightning streaks. Goodness and cruelty rubbed shoulders. Memory and forgetfulness were intertwined. I remembered her petulance when she did not get her own way, her sulks when she was thwarted. I could not avoid the suspicion that she might craftily be manipulating us all in order to get her own way, an old lady's prerogative down the ages. But later an incident occurred that left me in no doubt about the reality of her mental condition. It was about 8.30 in the morning. Chummy and I were the last to leave and were just stepping out when the telephone rang. Is that non artist's house? Sid the fish here. I thought you ought to know. Sister Monica Joan has just gone past me shop in her nighty. I sent the lad after her so she won't come to no harm. I gasped in horror and quickly told Chummy. We grabbed her sister's cloak from the hall stand and sprinted down towards Sid's fish shop. Sure enough, weaving a zigzag line down the East India Dock Road, the fish boy a couple of paces behind was Sister Monica Joan. 
She was wearing only a long white nighty with long sleeves. Her bony shoulders and elbows stuck out under the thin cloth. You could have counted every vertebra in her spine, and her feet and ankles were blue-black with cold and bleeding. The wind blew thin white strands of hair upwards from a head that was nearly bald. Her roomy red-rimmed eyes were watering. Her nose was bright red, and a dewdrop hung on the tip. My heart gave a lurch, and I realised how much I loved her. We spoke to her. She looked at us as though we were strangers, and tried to push us aside, doggedly, determinedly trudging on. Mind! Out of my way! I must get to them! The waters have broken! That brute will kill the baby! He killed the last one, I swear it! I must get there! Out of my way! She took another few steps on bleeding feet. Chummy threw the warm woolen cloak around her shoulders, and I put my cap on her head. The sudden warmth seemed to bring her to her senses. Her eyes focused, and she looked at us in recognition. I said slowly, Sister Monica Joan, it's breakfast time. Mrs. B has made some nice hot porridge for you, with honey in it. It will be getting cold if you don't come now. She looked at me eagerly and said, Porridge? With honey? Oh, lovely! Come along, then. What are you standing there for? Did you say porridge? With honey? She took two steps and cried out in pain. Obviously she had not been aware of her cut and bleeding feet. Thank God for Chummy, her size and strength. She picked Sister Monica Joan up in her arms as though she were a child and carried her all the way back to Nonata's house. I attended my morning visits as though in a dream. Now and then in life, love catches you unawares, illuminating the dark corners of your mind and filling them with radiance. Once in a while, you are faced with a beauty and a joy that takes your soul all unprepared by assault. 